Welcome to Fire Breathing Kittens, a standalone Dungeons and Dragons podcast. Every episode is a separate, complete adventure, so you can listen to them in any order. We are joined today by Olive Mudo. Hey, everybody. Olive is a bipedal crocodile. She's a level 18 Way of the Open Hand monk wearing a white Jedi style robe and baggy brown pants. Kes. Hi. Kes is an Arakokra barbarian, ranger, and fighter multiclass. She is currently level 18 and she has a bow and arrow. She looks like a female American Kestrel, but with arms and wings. So she's about five feet tall. And she's wearing a tiki skirt and a bunch of jewelry and a cool new belt. Yes, that is Kess. And finally, Dr. Crud the Third. Save the best for last, thank you very much. Dr. Crud stands at eight feet two inches tall, five feet two inches wide. He is a level 18 doctor. He is a loxodon. He wears uh, blue jeans, a lab coat, a white button down shirt with a red tie. He, his lab coat has a jenny pocket, a beans pocket. The jenny pocket is occupied. The beans pocket is not. And he recently upgraded his belt. It is a decorative leather belt with a belt buckle that has a stylized cat on it. And it says, better call beans. Amazing. Um, Dr. Crud the third. We're going to open this episode uh, after some trouble has been happening for you. Uh, you remember some time ago, you uh, were put in a time loop by a, uh, a time hag that you swiftly defeated. This was the episode, the final replay. Dancing and, uh, fish, dancing <laughs> fish, dancing fish, dancing fish. Yep. It turns out that time hag was part of a coven. Some of their sisters came to hunt you down. You solved it all, but in the process, you were hit by some time magic. And um, you are fine, but ever since then, Jenny has been experiencing some strange symptoms. Uh, it started the next day, where suddenly she was able to walk. And um, as you know, Jenny is your daughter, uh, she is uh, part Luxlung and seemingly part dragon. Both of them have, have extraordinarily long lifespans and you don't know what's been going on. So maybe tell me what you've been doing uh, to, to, to diagnose Jenny before the start of this episode. And I'll tell you what, what you got to find out. Well, as everybody knows, Dr. Crud III has a medical free clinic wagon that he uses. And so... I imagine that he's had her in one of his, the uh, the beds doing full evaluations, making sure that she's happy and bubbly and going, scratching his head and doing medical procedures, non-invasive, to figure out what's going on. Blood draws, you know, the whole nine yard. Yeah, uh, give me a medicine check. Oh, you want a medicine check. That is what I'm good at. Okay, that's going to be an 18 plus 15, so it's whatever you want. <laughs> an 18 plus 15. Well, we have a 33. Dr. Crud, uh, you can tell uh, that Jenny seems to be perfectly healthy, but there is something abnormal going on. You can't tell what it is even with a medicine check because there seems to be something strange going on. Uh, but you do, as you're measuring this and, and, and looking at Jenny... Um, it would seem that she uh, is actually accelerating. This aging is happening faster and faster, and we're going to fast forward a bit uh, to the current moment where you are in the lab of Boltzmann, the brain-in-a-jar artificer wizard, uh, who's at least got some equipment that you don't have, and you've exhausted all medical uh, uh, knowledge. There's nothing... You know that there is no disease that uh, that causes this normally, and uh, you are joined here by uh, Olive, uh, who's kind of been on your case about the possibility of something like this happening since you started carrying around a baby as an adventurer. And uh, Kess is uh, also there. Um, who, Kess, you were summoned by, by Boltzmann. He asked you to come here. You don't know why yet. And um, uh, 
you, uh, Boltzmann has just run some diagnostics and uh, he's done some, uh, he's done the usual wizard stuff, you know, like you've, you've gone to the clerics and this is, this is, you, he's tried to dispel magic, he's tried to remove curse, it all didn't do anything. Uh, it seems that Jenny is continuing to grow, but uh, he says he has a temporary solution and uh, rolls towards you, he's a brain in a jar on wheels and uh, gives you a, a, a thing that kind of looks like a like a combination between a squid and a fanny pack uh, with a big red button on it and says, uh, Dr. Crud, uh, I'm afraid I don't have a permanent solution for you, but I do have a temporary one. Please put this, put this item on and then I will tell you more. I believe time is of the essence here. Now, I, I, one thing before I do this, are you sure you're not trying to get revenge from when I kicked your butt? Dr. Crud, you know as well as I do that we have become good friends since then, and that was only a friendly endeavor. Also, that was only a technicality, because if you would be able to harvest organs like that, I'm sure I would have, I would have, I would have just uh, knocked you out cold within a couple rounds of combat. I, I would so, trust you, but if this hurts me or Jenny, next time I won't go so nice on you. It's, it's complicated, all right? Uh, but I... You don't have to put it on right now. I can explain what it is first. Is it, does it go on me or her? What this does, this is a... See, the issue that Jenny has is is sort of an excessive temporal flow. Uh, you know? And I've created this device to be able to absorb that. It's a sort of temporal tampon or tampon. I'm not quite sure about the name yet. Uh, maybe a time sponge or a time absorbance unit. A clock sucker. I'm getting off track. Uh, this will allow, <laughs> this will allow you, Doctor Kra, to absorb the extra time that Jenny that is generating into your own body. So she doesn't get older, but I do. It's a temporary effect on you. You can take off the tampon at any point, and uh, you will go back to your normal age. But if you do, you won't be able to to uh, go and. Turn it on again. It's a single use. If you take it off, throw it away. It will explode and cause a lot of damage. Gotcha. Okay. He'll put. He'll slap that on. Okay. As you put on this uh, this device, um, it starts humming, and uh, you feel like some magical effect take uh, part over your body, and uh, you don't know what it is yet, but um, uh, you presume you will find out in a minute as uh, Boltzmann is explaining more to you guys about what he's found. Uh, but first, he turns to you and says, Now, Dr. Crot the Third, could you please just, uh, for everybody in the room, summarize how Jenny came about? Because it's a remarkable story. Well, I drank a potion and I laid an egg and then Jenny was hatched a year later. Hi, you can lay eggs too? <gasps> Not normally. Are, are, are you a bird? You don't look like a bird, but maybe you are a bird. <gasps> no, I'm an elephant Kes guy. Kes kind of like flaps her wings excitedly. <laughs> I lay eggs too. Kes knocks over some, some uh, valves that are on shells haphazardly. <laughs> She's flapping around her wings. <laughs> and uh, Boltzmann says, careful there, careful there. Now... This is interesting. See, Dr. Crud, I was wondering myself about the origin of Jenny since uh, I did some genetic analysis, and it seems that she is indeed your biological daughter. You are her biological mother, in fact, since you were the one who laid the egg. But a child comes about from a pairing of genes, and it seems that Jenny is half dragon. Now, from what I can tell, there's some interaction between her genes and this magic that, that affected you, which is causing her to, to uh, age rapidly, as you say. Do you know the name of this potion maker so I can perhaps give you more of a hint about where to send you, since the crux of what I'm saying is some person, some dragon, perhaps, must have had the DNA harvested and put into a potion to make you pregnant. Well, the, we're, we're still not 100% sure if it was the goblins that were making the potions or if the guy that they imprisoned was making the potions and he was just screwing them up on purpose. Um, but yeah, I don't remember a name. Ah. We need to go back to the files. 
we have files or all that information's in. Yes, yes. Go back to the files and tell me tell me this information quickly. Olive, you got the files right in front of you, don't you? <laughs> okay, I'll pull them up. <laughs> all right. Do any of these names sound familiar? Kalo, Copper Coil, Grack, Nightarm, Spork, Dayface, Nose are the Goblins, Grieve, Mundlewort, Flimby, Decanto, Percival, Percy, Meniscus, Ollie, Flimby. Chindlebrook. You, you mentioned Flimby, Decanto. He's a gnomish alchemist, is he not? His potions were all the rage about 40 years ago. He was able to do magnificent, inexplicable things with them. He had a secret ingredient of some sort. And, uh, I actually was running uh, an, uh, a pharmaceutical or chemical company at the time, and I, I tried to tried to get his secrets. Uh, it would seem uh, he was a bit paranoid about guarding it. I wasn't able to track it down. Well, it seems I, like it's uh, dragon stuff. Yes. So I was actually able to get some leads. Hang on. Yes. I remember why I called you here, Cass. Uh, ah, you told me I get to fight something. Uh, yes, what do I get to fight? And is there food involved or anything shiny? He said something like that. I remember he said something like that. About fighting. Yes. Yes, yes, guess. There is something worth... I presume there's there's always something worth fighting, right? Or it's just not an adventure. In any case, it's the Neruk. These is, these are the orcs that raised you, right? Oh, uh, yes. Yes, the, the Neruk. What, the, what about them? I thought they were very far away from here. They are indeed very far away from there, but Flimby Decanto has a history of traveling and had a run-in with the Neruk uh, sometime, uh, some 50 years ago. And oh. after that, he had this remarkable ingredient in his possession. I was hoping that perhaps you could lead uh, Dr. Crud III and Olive to, uh, to the Neruk orcs to try and find this, uh, this uh, component that could lead you toward Jenny's father, so to speak. Uh, yeah, I, I could. It, um, yeah, I, I could do that, actually. Yes. Uh, it is very far away, so it will take a long time, but, um, I, I have this. And then she pulls out her feather token. Um, so someone told me that I can just, uh, throw this in the air and call out, uh, call out a name of, of a bird. I think it sounds like, uh, <laughs> like pasare, and then when I say pasare, uh, and throw the thing up in the air, it turns into a giant bird that can carry all of us there. As you, as you <laughs> throw the feather token into the air and say oh, pasare, I, I, I don't, uh, I, I don't throw it in the air because I'm inside. <laughs> I, oh, I, I should, just like wave should, my arms you should, about. You should, you should, you should. Oh, you should. Got you there. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm just like waving Both it about. Whoa, 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 whoa! Let's not summon any giant birds inside my laboratory. How far away? I think the Nuruk are uh, about 10,000 miles away, are they not? Uh, yes. They, uh, yeah, something like that. Um, I, I don't know the number, but I know it just took me a very long time to get there. How many days did it take? Uh, hmm. You see, Kaz is not very good at numbers, so she's just, like, thinking. Uh, from, from there to here, it took me about, uh... I don't know. Uh, well, I saw that the the stars have, sh have shifted quite a bit, and um, the moon kind of it it changed phases. So I don't know. It it was um, it was a full moon before, but then it became a half moon. So around that time. As you have been rambling, uh, Boltzmann, a giant brain, has been computing in his head and is like, yes, 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 with the velocity of a giant bird, you could travel about 500 miles per day. It would take you about three weeks to get to the Naruk. No, 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 that won't do at all. You need a quicker means of travel. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. I recently upgraded the, uh, the, uh, cart of the Sea Scouts, uh, to be able to travel through space and time. Maybe you can talk to them and they will be able to help you out. Uh... Ah, huh? Sea Scouts? Wait, who are those? Oh, they live in a cookie castle orphanage. Uh, I'm sure they will help you out. They are very rich and very generous. Oh, can't you just upgrade my cart real quick? Oh, I would, Dr. Crud, but I'm afraid I have to go on an adventure with, uh, with, uh, Tanager Goodfellow and Furious Johnson. We are supposed to rescue the world. There's some there's some evil cult of Tritons who want to flood the entire world. So I'm I need to head off in like ten minutes. But 
if ah, you just uh, like 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 Eren? Is, yes, is Eren yes. evil? He seemed very no, nice when I met no, him. No, there's just, it's a very diverse people. <laughs> oh yes, that is true. Yes, he's the only one I met, but um, I guess not all of them are nice like he is. Yes, yes, uh, that is exactly the problem that I'm trying to solve. So, could you perhaps go to the Naruk, uh, try and ask the sea scouts if they can help you, and um, bring me back a a scale or like a cheek swab or a trunk swab of this of this uh, dragon or whatever it is, and then I will be able to. Uh, Analyze that and possibly find a cure from there. Or maybe you even can yourself, Dr. Krupp. You have a, a lot of medical equipment in your lab. Yeah, I can't take it with me because you refuse to upgrade my cart. Oh, indeed. This is a problem. Uh, just take some medical stuff into the Sea Scout's cart, all right? Now, time is of the essence, all right? And as a Boltzmann says this, you hear a bing, and the red button on your uh, on your device lights up, Dr. Krupp III. And Boltman says, ah, a growth spurt. Now, you need to be quick to press that button, Dr. Crud, or the uh, the actual time will flow into Jenny herself, and she will age up. Dr. Crud pushes it cautiously. <laughs> uh, Dr. Crud, you are uh, 61 years old, right? Yes. And Olive is 21, and Kess is 10, right? Yes. Olive is 24. 24. Uh, but you're all considered a young adult for your species, or is Olive uh, like an, a more a, a normal adult? She's like a 35-year-old human. Lizard folk just don't live as long as humans do. Yeah, yeah okay, so we consider Olive Eric like Hulkra. a full adult. Yeah, like, Eric Hulkra reached maturity around age 3 and um, live until age 30, so she's like a third of the way through. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, so, our, yeah, so I think Kess is a full... Is, is a young adult, Olive is a normal adult, and Dr. Crud is a young adult as well? Does that make sense? <laughs> sure. We'll go with that. Well, uh, not anymore, uh, Dr. Crud, because now, uh, as you press this button, you feel, boom, you get, uh, you, you worked out a lot, but now you've got a bit of a punch again, um, and uh, you, some of your hair, hairs turn gray. You're still very fit, like you feel still very strong. It has no uh, impact on your uh, mechanical ability. Yet, but uh, you are. Uh, wait, 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 wait! Why didn't we put that on Olive, who has timeless body? Oh, this is a good question, Olive. Would you like one as well? Yeah, if Doctor Card the Third is like noticeably getting gray, then I'll be like, hand that over here. I literally don't age until I drop dead. Oh, but Olive, now this is going to be a problem because uh, you need to age to to uh, function as a receptacle for the tampon. Ah. Uh... Sorry, Dr. Crud the Third, I tried. It's all right. I've but... always been gray anyway, so it's you can't tell. <laughs> Olive, I have a question. Isn't this a uh this this timeless body, is it a mind of a matter thing? I thought this is how monks work. Yeah, we have mastered control of ourselves, so I you know, magic is the one thing I just don't understand. Couldn't tell you how it worked, but if you study these scrolls, and I, I take out my correspondence course letters that I'm working on right now, I, it's like carrying around flashcards at all times. You could do it too. Maybe you'd understand it oh. better than I do. Interesting. I will get started on that right after my mission. Uh, but my question is, if it's a matter of mind of a body, couldn't you turn it off for the time being? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's just that I have three <laughs> tampons here, so if you if you if you want uh, more of them, then uh, uh, you could use yourselves as as backup reserves for for Jenny's aging. But uh, don't feel obliged to take them. Can you put one on, Boltzmann? <laughs> I'm afraid it only works in the vicinity of Jenny. I could put one on now, but it would not work anymore when uh, we are more than a hundred feet apart. Ah. If we if we all put one on, is it uh, is it going to spread between us? Like we all age a little bit, or is it going to be the same amount if one person puts it on or if everyone puts it on? Oh, that's a good question, Cass. Yes, it will be spread out if you all put one on. Okay, so... then I'll put one on too, so that uh, ah. my friends can uh, don't don't age as much. Good, good. That will buy Jenny some time. And by the way, just to clarify, mechanically, Timeless Body says that I can't be aged magically, so I'd love to, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of it. <laughs> Olive, I will allow you to to make a wisdom check to try and uh, 
and disable that temporarily, but uh, uh, only if you want. I like mechanics. I'm one of those players. I like. I like the rules. So if it says I can't be H- magically, I'm like I go with it. So she be, wants uh, to keep eating what she wants yeah. to keep eating everything she can eat any and not get poisoned. <laughs> that's what she wants. Oh, that's different. Um, but like I don't know. I enjoy the confines of the rules. It's like a fun playground to play in. I don't. Very know. good. Yeah. Very good. Now, uh, anytime Jenny is about to age up, uh, both your devices will light up, and the person who first presses the button will age up instead. Off you go then. All right. All right. Uh, g- goodbye, goodbye, Boltzmann. Have fun on your adventure. Yeah, good luck with the Neruk. Tell me all about it when you get back. I- I- I'm also happy to see you kept the mustache. <laughs> what mustache, <laughs> Boltzmann? <laughs> Never mind. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only time Bossman has been passed out. A mustache has been drawn on his uh, glass container. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, what uh, are you going to do? You're free to find another means of transport, but uh, Boltzmann suggested you go to the Cookie Castle orphanage to talk to the Sea Scouts. Well, I will turn to the uh, to the rest of the party, and uh, and I will say, so. Yes, he, he said to uh, go to the Neruk, Neruk tribe, and they did actually fight a dragon a while ago. It was before I was hatched, born, adopted, I don't know. But um, it is it is very far away. It is very far outside of this country of Guaso. Like, uh, yeah, like, w- would you guys uh, want to go there? I, I can definitely show you around. I would be happy to. But what, no, what do you guys It doesn't sound like we have like? a choice. We have to go. Or at least I do. Yeah, and and I will go with you because I want to help you and I want to help save uh, Jenny. She's she's very cute. I mean, if I w- if I was very very hungry, I would eat her. That's how cute she is. But I'm not very hungry, so don't worry. I ate yesterday. I'd be more worried about her eating you. She wasn't full after Tanager. Oh, that was just a finger. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't have I mostly feathers. I don't I don't think I'll be very tasty, but she can try if she wants to. All right, let's go talk to these Sea Scout people, see uh, how, how their stuff is so fast. Yeah, the Sea Scouts. I, I, I feel like I've heard them before. Uh, who, They're cookie who pushers. Ah, they are. I take you guys to the Cookie Castle. You enter the uh, Cookie Castle Orphanage. This, guy, this, this place looks a lot nicer than the last time you were here, Olive. It was uh, dilapidated and run by sea hags, but after the... Uh, sea Scouts took control of their own empire and uh, Mrs. Cookie started taking care of them. Uh, they have been using the actual ovens upstairs and not the ones in the basement. And um, they have expanded their uh, business into into a bit of an empire. And uh, as you walk to the back, you see uh, Susie, Ember, and Oat standing there. The uh, little uh, Sea Scouts that you have helped uh, many times already. Susie is a, a seven-year-old half-elf. Ember is a fire genasi. And Oat is a furbolg who doesn't speak. And Susie pipes up as she sees you and says, Ah, Olive, hello. Hi, Susie. You look so cute in your Sea Scout uniform. Oh, thank you. It's brand new. We can afford a new one every day now, but we don't buy a new one every day. We, uh... Invest the money so that we can grow our business. Boltzmann's been teaching you well. Thank you. I think so, too. Amber has been doing a lot of accounting, and um, it's uh, it's been a lot of pressure, but I think we can do a lot of good with it. Yeah. What are your, what are your plans? What do you want to be when you grow up? I suppose I don't have much time to think about that because I'm running a... a uh, global business at the age of seven i suppose i'm rich enough that i can do what i want maybe i'll become a doctor just like me yes maybe you can teach me sometime dr crud can (laughs) i intern in your free clinic absolutely boltzmann's been telling us that we need to get some unpaid interns unpaid interns are the best (laughs) that's a wonderful dream Susie. you can do anything you want Uh, thank you olive would you like some cookies always she gets you out a box of sea snaps. 
I eat them. I have a very large crocodile mouth. It's not pleasant when I open and show 80 teeth, but I do. And I crunch all the cookies. <laughs> yeah. The sea scouts are so used to you by now that they don't they don't care about you. And uh, yeah, Susie, Ember, and Oates are just uh, happy that their friends have come to visit. Hi, Ember. Hey, Guess, How are you doing? Uh, all right. Um, I have a bunch of bracelets. And, and then I show her, like, the bracelets that, um, <laughs> that, that I got from, from I'm a Fade Knot. You want one? <laughs> yes, please. They all run and they all want a bracelet. Yeah, I, 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 give, them, I give them bracelets. I, I give them as, as many as, as, as they want. <laughs> I have, like, I don't know, 16 or something. You have 16? <laughs> of, of the same type of bracelet. <laughs> I just put on all the bracelets that I could find in the last, like, uh, episode I was in. Can you take the can you take them off now? Um yeah, like I think I can, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Olive took hers off right away. <laughs> okay. Um they each uh put on uh two bracelets and say, Oh, we love these bracelets. We hope we don't get drafted into any tournaments for this. <laughs> no, it, it's okay. I think they they don't really work anymore. I couldn't take them off when they when they still work, so it it, it should be fine. And huh. and if you do, just just call us. We'll we'll be there and we'll uh we'll I'll bite someone for you if you want. Well, thank you. Uh, then we can be in a team together. Yes. Yes. You like to fight? Um, I'm training to be a wizard. Ember says, she's got <gasps> a she's got a book behind her. But I'm also training to be an accountant, and that's more pragmatic right now for the business. I see. Okay. Well, anytime you want to go fight something, you know where to find me. I'll be in the fire breathing kittens hall. <laughs> Susie uh, pipes in and uh, says, So, why did you come here today? Well, Baltzman said you have a wagon that he upgraded that will take us 10,000 miles in like a few seconds. Oh, yeah. Boltzmann says that the laws of physics are just oppression by the gods. You can take the wagon <laughs> if you want. We are a little bit scared to use it. Can, can you tell me how it operates? We're not sure. I think you you get on it. Amber takes over here. She, she's taken some classes at wizardry and says, I think it's like a, like a teleport spell. You envision the the location that you need to go, and depending on how familiar you are with it, uh, that determines your chance of success. She looks gotcha. very proud. All right, Cass, that's all you. Huh? Your, your, your home? You're oh, familiar? Oh, yes, yes. Uh Sorry, yes, I, I was I was looking at the I was looking at the device. It's it, it's very shiny. There is this uh yeah, there is this thing that's very shiny on it. And then you see that she was pecking at something. Uh yes, yes, it, it is my home. I am familiar with the area. So can it take us like straight to the tribe or can it take us to the foot of the mountain or something? Do we still have to climb a mountain? Because they are near the top of a mountain on the kind of side of it. It yeah, sounds you... like it will take you wherever you wanna go. All you gotta do is picture it in your lit in your mind. And then you say, I want to go there. You push the shiny red button, and we go. Oh, I get to push a shiny button? I think. No, there's still a horse. It's oh. very scary. <laughs> and uh, uh, okay. so think the, 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 you the, the go. wagon comes out. Uh, it's it's uh, coming out of the shed. Uh, the horse is now uh, glowing blue. It's still got the cyborg eye, but it's floating a, a like an inch off the ground. And um, it's... Uh, Turns its head to you and opens its mouth in a whinny, but you don't hear anything. The card is also <laughs> floating off the ground. Oh, it can fly. Uh, okay, so I just think of where I want to go, and it will take us there, all of us? Yes, I, I think guess. it works three times per day. Ah, three times per day. Okay, I mean, let's... So, so you only here. have three chances. <sighs> three chances. Uh, okay, uh, yes, let's, uh, let's, let's get in then. So, uh, <laughs> I, I've never ridden a horse before, <laughs> so I, I just, like, kind of <laughs> hover over the cart, just, like, not sure of what to do. <laughs> uh, how do, what do you do with this thing? Do you get in? Do you just go above it? I always go above, I always fly above a cart whenever someone's driving it. It's just you, easier you that way. You see that bench right there where the reins for the mechanical, glowy, bluey horse is attached to? Yeah. Put your butt right there. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I kind of just like uh, float down into the into the wagon and just like uh, 
<laughs> try to sit down, but it's it's really hard for me because I have a tail. So I just end up perching on the on the stool, just like crouching on it, <laughs> like facing backwards. <laughs> and then like this. Close enough. Now we're going to get in and then you grab the reins. You think about where you want to go and you say mush horsey. Okay. And um, hopefully that works. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to like uh, wait for everyone to get in. Um, birds can like swivel their head all the way around. So like <laughs> she, she she's like uh, she's like facing Back, like her body's facing backward, but her head's like kind of facing the the front. It, it, it looks it looks really weird, but <laughs> yeah, she, she waits for everyone to get in. Excellent. Dr. Grid's uh, inside. Yep, Olive does have a tail, but she can sit normally. Oh, so does Doctor Crud, and he sits normally. At this moment, you hear a ping, and both your buttons light up, Doctor Crud and Guess. Doctor okay. Crud pushes it. I I push it too. Uh, Dr. Crud was first, and now is middle-aged. Uh, Holy crap, that one fast. Yes. Uh, <laughs> he looks a little bit older. It's a bit harder to tell, because you're all different types of animal people, right? Uh, but um, you uh, feel like you are physically aging, Dr. Crud, and um, you... Uh, have a little bit of a uh, pain in your bones. You uh, get some some ills. Uh, you're still the same person inside your head, but um, uh, your body is uh, starting to hurt a little bit, and you gain a disadvantage on all physical ability checks from here on out. Okay, Olive, you see uh, Doctor Crud sitting next to you, uh, aging noticeably <laughs> as he uh, presses this red button. Uh, but Jenny is uh, in his pocket, cooing happily, as if nothing is wrong, and goes to Doctor Crud, looks up and says, "Da da." That's Mama. You know that. <laughs> you know you could probably let her age through the diaper stage at least. <laughs> but the diaper stage is the most fun. Oh, <laughs> all right. Guess you have the reins in your hands. All right. I will think about. Um, well. I I'm gonna like um, swivel my head around to look at everyone else. <laughs> it's, it's really weird, um, and and I will say, uh, well, the Neruk are not very. Uh, they don't receive a lot of outsiders. They probably don't know much about technology. So just to be safe, I'm going to transport us to about a mile outside of their their village, their camp. So yeah, but it's okay because I know exactly how to get there. Um, I have a very good memory when it comes to uh, landmarks. So then I'm just going to, like, uh, nod to them, and then I'm going to hold the reins by hands, press the button, and think of, like, a mile, like, uh, kind of west of the, of the village. Yeah. Okay, west. so there's an, there's an actual village. They're not nomadic. Uh, that's good to know. Um, they have, like, a settlement, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, perfect. As you press the button, uh, you all hear uh, a strange sound, a buzzing in your ears as uh, reality seems to stretch out into infinity. Uh, Dr. Crud, you look next to you and you see Olive just uh, becoming infinitely long. Olive, you see uh, the same. <laughs> and even though you are immune to time magic, uh, you uh, are transported through time every day. And right now you're being transported through time and space. And within a moment... Guess you are uh, riding a galloping horse through a uh, tunnel of stars that are wisping by you at light speed. You see uh, aberrations, giant aberrations floating through the night sky enough to, <laughs> to dwarf you. And uh, you are trying to keep the uh, spot uh, a mile west of the village in your mind as you uh, navigate to uh, the other end of this uh, infinite hell. Uh, so, please roll me a D100. I would say that you're very familiar with this spot, is that right? Yeah, I, I, I would be very familiar. I've hunted there many times. So, a D100? Yes, please. Okay. That is a 37. A 37 is on target, guess. <laughs> <laughs> wow. She managed to, like... <laughs> this, is, this is, like, a feat of mental strength for her because, like, you have all these shiny, like, aberrations and stars going by, so she's just, like, trying really hard to concentrate on this one spot, and she did it. As you concentrate on this one spot, suddenly, bloom, 
uh, reality snaps back together like uh, like an elastic band, and uh, the uh, carriage is suspended ten feet in the air and crashes down <laughs> on the ground uh, outside the uh, village of the Meruk. And in the distance, you uh, see the mountain. In the distance, you see mountain Kip Kriknimba. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, not that much of a distance, actually. The the village is built uh, quite close to it. And um, you exit the carriage, which is again emitting a, a low hum. And uh, the horse is uh, turning its head towards you and uh, opens its mouth as if asking for a sugar cube or carrot or some sort of snack. Uh, well... <laughs> Guess is right now she's just like uh, staring up uh, up into space uh, backward with her beak open. <laughs> that took a lot out of her. <laughs> well, which way do we go? She, she, she doesn't answer for for a minute. And, and then like, she's just like, huh? Wait, wait, which way? Oh, I, I landed west, so uh, she, she kind of just like, um... Like tur- turns her head around to where it's like supposed to be, and, and then like uh, jumps out, jumps out of the cart, flies in the air, just tries to get her bearings. Uh, well, we are a mile west of the village. At least I hope so. So it should be this way. And she points east, and then starts like fall, and starts like uh, kind of like uh, slowly, kind of flying over there, kind of surveying the surroundings. Like she, she just starts like uh. She's just, like, in the air waiting for the other people to follow her. I follow. Hey, horsey, do you work like a regular horsey, too? Can I, can we just, you know, use you to go over that way? Um, the horse turns its head toward you, and you hear a voice speaking in your mind and say, uh, Greetings, Dr. Coret the Third. I can move anywhere. Greetings, horse from inside my head. Let's go that way. Are you trying to get the horse to uh, walk uh, or... Um... Yeah, to pull the cart to the east. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, the horse, without moving its legs, just starts to drift east. <laughs> Thank it's you, moving horsey. Ahead. <laughs> I like you. You're my friend now. You're welcome, Dr. Crud the Third. You know, I might I... have a job for you if you don't like this Boltzmann character. <laughs> I must say... The Sea Scouts have not been much appreciative of my godly powers. <laughs> All right, we'll tell you what. I will get into negotiations with them. They're scared of you anyway, so you're going to be mine. I would love that, Dr. Crab the Third. I will pull your free clinic to wherever it could go in the world. It seems like this would be a more worthy cause than selling cookies and establishing a global empire anyway. Agreed. Um, Olive, guess, uh, as Dr. Crud is uh, conversing with this horse inside his head, <laughs> you are uh, moving east. Um, Olive, how are you feeling at this moment? Uh, you've been asked to come along here because uh, out of all the fire-breathing kittens, I think you are the one who has been uh, most consistently uh, concerned about Jenny's safety and and trying to keep her in... Good health. Uh, you, I think you even called uh, the fancy <laughs> equivalent of CPS on Child Protective Services on Dr. Crud. I did. He doesn't know that, though, because it happened out of game afterwards. Yeah, I, I suppose they stopped by and they saw no problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they did a welfare check. Um, I mean, I care about Jenny in like an abstract way, but then she tries to eat me sometimes. And so it's like from a distance, you know? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, um, the only person she doesn't try to eat is beans. <laughs> uh, but then again, all of you also try to eat a lot of uh, beings, even ones that you can talk with. So uh, maybe you well, uh, have a certain kinship with Jenny there, right? It's it's uh, you got to eat something, and when you can talk to everything, that you know, you, <laughs> what are you going to do? Starve to death? So <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of which, you see a wild dog here. <laughs> Oh, I 
Can I do a perception check on the fur status of this wild dog? Does it look like it has mange? Like, it is it skinny? Does it look like it's been out for a while? Listen, when I say wild dog, I mean we are way out beyond the civilized world here. This is unspoiled nature. There are, well, relatively, there are people here. There are the Naruk orcs uh, here, but um, they live more or less harmoniously with nature like they move around and and uh they hunt but they don't toil the land and and make sure that the populations are healthy so this is a a wild wild dog this is not a wild dog that's roaming the streets of nikamoy this is uh, uh probably a scout for its troop or something like that oh, okay so it's like a coyote or something basically yeah. uh okay well i mean i <laughs> so I've gotten a lot of flack for this, so I'll just explain. Um, in cities and in like populated areas, dogs that get loose and go feral, they like collect in packs, and when they get hungry enough, they eat like children and old people. And it's a problem in. I mean, I, I don't want to say this because it really freaked out the person who played Rolo, but I'll just say it for you guys again. Like, it's a problem in the place where you live, like legit, like right now. So, um, it's just not often reported on, but like. More than one person dies per year in each country from this. So Olive sees herself as doing a public service when she kills these dogs. Uh, so it's not like she, she's not a ravenous animal who's like, I love the taste of flesh. of, of <laughs> Canid flesh is my favorite. It's not like that. It's like uh, we really should have a dog catcher, don't you think, guys? Um, so uh, so she, she's not like in a murderous rage for all coyotes that walk past her. <laughs> I know she's I was just wondering if you were hungry. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm a person too. <laughs> Thanks though. <laughs> is 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 this dog like does it have markings on it? Because the the uh my like tribe the Nedok tribe of orcs keeps dogs, but they like um use them mostly for hunting, for like wayfaring, that kind of stuff, but they put like they like paint them with markings and stuff. So like is is this one of those dogs? Can I try to see if it uh, is? this is not one of those dogs. This is an actual wild dog. Ah, wild dog. Yeah. I Oh, like, um, <laughs> I, I know that Olive likes dogs, so I, I, I would point it out to her, but I, I said that she would, she would probably say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, that one's minding its own business. Uh, it's, it's sort of like any other wild animal, you know, not like that pit bull that, you know, is allowed to roam three blocks around its house and could eat the random four-year-old. Now that pit bull should be put down. This coyote minding its business, not so much. Ah, I see. So you only eat dogs that are, uh, that are bad and that hurt people. I see. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that too. Like, I, I only yeah. eat things that are evil. Or if I just feel hungry, I will I, I will eat it. Like, yeah, that, that one that one dog. Uh, <laughs> I thought you wanted to kill it and I was hungry, so yeah. Anyways. <laughs> you were hangry. <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yes, be be careful for dogs that have uh, markings on them. Because those are those belong to Neruk. So, yeah, they might look a bit... Uh, they might be a bit aggressive to strangers, but... They probably won't hurt you if they, <laughs> if if you tell them something in Orkish, which I, I know Orkish, so it should be good. All right. I won't eat your pet, Cass. Don't worry. As yeah, you I, are I any, but, yeah. uh, conversing about uh, the difference between city dogs and wild dogs, um, guess a uh, little green head pops up and uh, uh, you see a familiar face. One... Uh, Orcish child who was a bit smaller. Uh, a y when did you leave? A, a year ago. I. When did I leave? I, I left like, yeah, a year ago. So a year ago, recently. and uh, uh, the kid shouts, "Guess!" and you see uh, uh, six more uh, heads of children, Orcish children of various ages, pop up, and uh, they come running toward you, uh, together with one uh, guardian, uh, who. Uh, you actually know is named uh, Kirby. Kirby. And, uh, and uh, the children all run up to you. Guess, 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 guess. And uh, <laughs> I, I kind of like, uh, um, kind of like flap downward and land on the ground and just like, oh, hi, it's, it's been a while. <laughs> oh my God, guess you're back. Go. You, uh, they're all shouting uh, at once. So you can't, you can't make make out much of what they're saying but Kirby comes up and, and says children all aside oh guess come here and he pulls you in in a big hug yeah I, I hug him back but by the way is, is he speaking to me in like orcish or common yeah yeah he's speaking to you in orcish um, in orcish 
Kirby is a uh, uh, like an orc. He's very muscular, but he's a bit short for an orc. Uh, he's like uh, like five foot uh, five foot five, I guess, <laughs> and uh, very broad. He's got a big bone on his head, and um, he says, uh, "Oh, Gus, you came back. Tell me, what is the outside world like?" Ah. Uh- well, we can. I can definitely catch you up on that. Um, that later. It is. It is full of shiny things. Then I just kind of like show <laughs> off the uh, the stuff that I have, and then I kind of like point toward the carriage that Doctor that Doctor Cress that Doctor Doctor Crud is like. Uh, Doctor Crud is like carrying behind him, kind of, or like leading toward uh, toward him, and. Um, yeah, it, could be, it is nice to see you. Uh, I actually am, I'm here on um, on a mission. Uh, yes, I, I'd love to get reacquainted with everyone. Probably after, probably after we kind of solve this thing that is going on. Um, and I'm, I'm saying to this, uh, this to him in like Orcish. I'm kind of like gesturing toward the, the the friends um, that I have, like Olive and um, and Doctor Crud. And uh, yes, this is this is Doctor Crud. This is Olive, and um, Doctor Crud has a daughter, Jenny, and. Uh, like you guys can hear your names, but you cannot really understand what else Cass is saying. Oh, I can. Oh, yeah, I can understand all spoken languages. <laughs> I don't really know how. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, and then yeah, Cass kind of turns toward you two and says, uh, "In common, do you guys speak uh, Orkish, or can you guys understand what what we're saying here?" Mm. Oh, hey, hi, I'm Olive. Nice to meet you. And I'm speaking, apparently, I just reread Tongue of Sun and Moon. Uh, any creature that can understand a language can understand what I say. So I'm just speaking common, but you understand it. Olive, the children are in awe at you and your uh, giant crocodile snout. Um, you look very impressive, especially to these orcish people that have not uh, met. Like the adults will have met some outsiders, but the children haven't, and they are just gawking at you. And now that you speak orcish, uh, they just erupt in some uh, uh, raucous uh, uh, chatter among themselves. She speaks orcish. Are you an orc? <laughs> As a player, I've had this experience in real life. I've been the first person of my ethnicity that some people have seen as children. And, like, it's kind of horrifying how they all crowd around you and, like, they all want to touch you. Uh, so having been there, I uh, I know how Olive feels in this moment. Yeah. Uh, Gerby notices this and says, uh, Children, children, go back to the village. Go back to the village. Guess we'll be there in, in just, uh, just a minute. We will, well, we okay. will follow uh, you. Uh, hey, they've got to see a lizard folk sometime, right? I lay down on the ground. And I let them climb and sit on me. I keep my mouth closed so I don't have any auto snap reflexes. <laughs> I'm Olive Couch. <laughs> That's kind of weird. <laughs> Even if you meet people of a different identity, just lying down on the ground and letting them climb all over you. <laughs> but uh, the children uh, appreciate it. <laughs> I'm a lizard folk. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh Kirby says, uh, no, no, children, I insist. Go, Kess is in a hurry. Just, Kess, can you lead them to the village? We will follow. We'll be right behind you. Uh, okay, sure. And by the way, this is, this is Dr. Crud. He's an elephant person who, who also lays eggs. She's kind of confused here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then he's, he's really cool. And then she kind of like gestures toward him. Um, <laughs> and, um, she turns back to, uh, Kirby. And she, um, she says, so, uh, does anyone speak common in the village or do, do you speak common? Uh, yes, yes. I, I do not speak common, but, uh, I think, uh, Traktor speaks common and Rak speaks common. You know, Traktor is, is actually the chief of the village or was a year ago, uh, presumably still is. Uh, mm-hmm. it's an older orc woman. Uh, she, uh, she's kind of, uh, yeah, she's she's old, but she's still a a damn barbarian. She she's strong and she's broad, and uh, she's got a little comedian familiar. Ah, that another right. Olive Junior. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, we we mostly speak Orkish here. I, I'm I'm saying this to like uh, Doctor Crud. Um, we mostly speak Orkish here, but there are some people who can speak Common. It is the the leader and uh, Tak as well. Oh, okay. I, I don't speak Orcish. Oh, Horsey, do you speak Orcish? 
I do not need to speak, Dr. Krat the Third. <laughs> I was just wondering if you could translate for me. That's all I was asking. I, I could. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, um, I could have asked to translate. Uh, yeah, I, I can translate for you if, if, if you want. Uh, yeah. Kirby uh, walks up to you and uh, pulls you into a big hug, uh, Dr. Crud. Oh, is, Dr. Uh, Crud returns it with, with, with passion. <laughs> this is a display of... Uh, this is a marvelous display, you guys. You you take a moment to appreciate these two big burly men wrapping around each other in uh, one of the strongest hugs this world has surely ever seen. It's uh, It's beautiful. It's what it is. A display of uh, masculinity in an absolutely non-toxic instance. And uh, you, uh, uh, Tractor, uh, <laughs> let's go of Crud. And uh, it says, Tractor Crud the third. Tractor. And uh, motions to, to follow him to the village. Dr. Crud gives two thumbs up and a thumbs up with his trunk. <laughs> Uh, yeah, these orcs are very excited to uh, to see you. These ones are. Um, yeah, you had to work the village. And uh, yeah, guess you go ahead a little bit with the children and Tractor uh, uh, walks uh, next to Olive as uh, Dr. Crud uh, goes last with, uh, with the horse. And... Uh, yeah, I, I kind of like fly backwards. Um, I'm kind of like hovering, but also, but also going backwards because Kestrels can hover. Um, and Kes is quite dexterous, so she's she's gonna like fly backwards as well. Uh, she's no, she knows where she's going, and she's gonna like tell the children kind of like tales of the experiences she's had in the Fey Wild. Show them the giant mushroom that sh that she has, like the golden obsidian mushroom, and like she's gonna hand out some of the bracelets as well, just cause like you know to have some stuff from outside. And she's gonna tell basically like generic tales. It's just like oh you know they have these thing called pickles where you put uh, food to marinate for like. A month, and then it, apparently it tastes really good afterwards. Uh, and they have just a lot of stuff, and then yeah, she just goes rambling on. <laughs> Olive, um, can you give me an insight check as you walk next to the tractor? Twenty-nine. Twenty-nine. Uh, you notice that uh, he is looking at Guess, and um, he's got like a little glimmer in his eye, and uh, he turns to you and says. You know I hatched her from an egg. You must be very proud of her. Yeah, you can tell with that 29 inside uh, that Tractor is very proud, but also kind of sad uh, in this moment. And um, I don't know how much Olive wants to read into this, but uh, he is uh, feeling, feeling happy and sad at the same time. And uh, he turns to you and asks... Uh, are you uh, raising any children of your own, Olive? Uh, I have nieces and nephews. I have about a hundred of them. And you raise them all? No. Oh, gosh, no. Um, <laughs> I, I give them presents. You give them presents? That's about wow. it. <laughs> That's about it? Yeah. I, don't, I take them out for uh, camping weekends and volleyball retreats. Camping? What is Camping. We go in the woods, and I, I set up a volleyball court, and I just teach them how to play volleyball. And there's enough for teams, you see. Sounds to me like you are raising kids, Olive. Sometimes. On weekends. Niece and nephew weekend. <laughs> but uh, was Kess an easy child to raise? Not at all. No. But <laughs> oh, no. Why we not? Did, we did the job. She is, she is very short-tempered and uh, easy to fool by others. Uh, we've been trying to help. I was worried that she she uh, would not uh, would get in trouble when she went out into the world. But you have to you have to uh, let them go, right? If you love a bird, let it go, and if it loves you back, it'll fly back to you. It looks like Kess really appreciated how you raised her. She must love you a lot. It sounds to me like she came back for uh, this mission, but I'm sure we will we will be able to to catch up afterward. It's, uh, it's, it's just such, I'm sure you know with your camping weekends and volleyball, uh, volleyball teaching, it's, uh, a beautiful but also kind of sad thing because once you taught them to play volleyball, they know how to do it and they don't no longer need you to, to, to tell them how to do it. Do you feel like Kes doesn't need you anymore? 
oh, come on, look at her. Of course she doesn't need me anymore, but that's the way it's supposed to be, right? That's wh- I raised her to be like that. Me, me and the other orgs at the Reiruk. But I was the one who hatched her. <laughs> yeah. Well, she'll always need you for advice. Um, you look at, uh, you look at uh, Kirby and uh, this has uh, cheered him up a little bit. Uh, he said uh, he can still offer advice. And uh, you uh, nicely converse and, and, and you are very close to the village now and, and different people start to pop up. And uh, I think uh, you wanted to go to somebody who spoke common, right, Guess? Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, yeah, you go to the main hall in this village. This is like a, uh, it's, it's mostly made of wood and mud and, uh, uh, just, uh, natural materials. Like there's a, there's a hut which falls over here every week and they build up a new one. It's very mutative. There's no, there's no walls around it even. Uh, they just keep guard. And, uh, yeah, uh, you, uh, walk into the village and you are greeted by, Everyone here, there's a, it's during the day, so you, uh, so like half of the village will be out hunting or gathering, but everybody who is here uh, is crowding out into into the open space to to greet you guys, and uh, very happy to see uh, Kess mainly. Uh, Olive and uh, Dr. Crud, uh, you notice that they are a bit wary. The adults were very friend, the, the kids were very friendly towards you, the adults are not as uh, happy to see strangers necessarily. Uh, and uh, Cass, uh, people are uh, asking you too many questions to answer right now, <laughs> but I guess you lead them to uh, the, uh, the the big hut, right? Yeah. The big I'm, hut I'm where like, Tractor sits. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like really happy and excited to, to see everyone. And I'm like uh, kind of like uh, flying for a second on the ground for a second. Like I'm just very, very excited. And I'm just like, yeah, nice to see you all. Yes, I, I will definitely catch up with you later. But right now we are on some uh, kind of urgent business. And this is, these are my friends, Olive and um, Dr. Crud. I work with them, but they're also my friends. And Dr. Fran- Dr. Crud has a really cute, uh, really cute daughter. Her name is Jenny. So, uh, yeah, that is, that is them. And don't worry about this thing here. It, it will not harm any of you. It, 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 it looks weird, but it is a horse with a, a cart. So... <laughs> Yes. Uh, just try not to touch it, okay? Uh, it, it is weird, but yes, as long as you stay away from it, it is, it is fine. <laughs> they immediately crowd ag- around the cart and uh, start looking at it. Uh, Dr. Crud, uh, Jenny starts squirming in your pocket uh, ever since she got a little bit older that uh, initial uh, first day. Like, she's been wanting to, to, uh, to walk and explore a little bit. Uh, she's not able to vocalize that yet. She just says, da, da. That's mommy, <laughs> not dad, dad, mama. Let's come on, say mama. Mama. There you go, baby girl. You can pop your head right out. You can look around. That's fine. She wants out, out. All right, well, uh, hold on one second. I'm going to have to fashion me a little kid leash. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Crow will fashion himself a harness with a lead that ties around his uh, belt. And yes... That is perfectly fine. My brother had that happen to him. My I've had done that to my children. It is perfectly acceptable. Especially <laughs> when your children are capable of removing fingers. How or uh, running away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does Jenny have wings, Dr. Grad? Yes. Oh okay. gosh. <laughs> yeah. She's got uh so this is a, a just to just to give a she hasn't come out of the pocket before at all, I think. She's just sitting oh, yeah. on your lap she and been, been in your pocket and been in a baby burn. <laughs> it's actually she's toddled around before in the in the in the yeah. guild hall. That's uh that's very cute. But uh yeah. Uh Jenny is uh happy to be out and about and uh indeed toddling about and uh looking at all these kids. Uh they are uh trying to play with her and uh, just to give a visual description jenny is a, a half dragon half elephant child so she's uh five feet tall i don't know how you keep her in a pocket dr crud if she's five feet tall and you're eight feet tall it's a big pocket <laughs> yes uh so she is actually the the Naruk children are also quite tall for their age uh and quite sturdy these as you walk into this village you you can tell that everybody here is uh built and uh, the uh, she starts to kind of uh, uh, 
yeah, just just get to know these kids a little bit as they follow you. Uh, everybody follows you to the uh, to the big t- to the big hut, and um, uh, at this moment you hear another ping, and the red button lights up on your on your uh, on your tampon. <laughs> It's your turn, Chaos. I got hurt the last time. I, I'll, um, <laughs> I, I kind of just like look around, like, oh, right, and then I just push it quickly. Hmm. What does a bird look like when it gets older? <laughs> You're now a full-on adult. Uh, I'll let you describe it. So, um, there's like pretty much no change. I mean, you, you cannot really tell a lot based on like the, um, the outside of of the bird because they usually look pretty similar. Um, but like some of her feathers kind of like start falling out like they just kind of like shower around because they molt so that and then she has like a few new feathers growing in and she's like ah what happened to my feathers and you can also see like around her around her eyes like she has a couple more like wrinkles i guess um in in, in the flesh there so like she's just like looking around at all the feathers that are falling off of her huh I- looks like you got a bold spot oh <laughs> she kind of like uh turns around and like uh pecks at it ah it's okay my feathers will, will grow out again it'll just take a Little bit. They usually grow back every day after I lose them. That is why I can go and get into so many fights and still fly. Amazing. Uh, so, guess you're a full-on adult now. Uh, no mechanical drawbacks for you yet. You uh, go into the big hut where um, the so the Nuruk are kind of like an anarchist people. They have uh, a somewhat elected leader, but uh, the, the the rules are in place. But they are agreed upon by everybody, and uh, a tractor was uh, was uh, kind of chosen by the people. But there's also like a fighting competition involved, and uh, right now it's a very peaceful time for your tribe. And uh, but there have been more aggressive expansions in the past, of course. But uh, you are just maintaining your territory around uh, Kip Kriknimba, the mountain. Uh, no other this is this is your ground and uh tractor is uh, sitting there conversing with some of the older uh, people who live in this village uh people who are too old to uh, go out hunting and foraging but they're still doing some manual labor everybody contributes here everybody's doing their own uh their own thing and uh it changes from day to day but uh, everybody's doing the th- Thing that they're good at to uh, to aid the village as a whole. So you are all entering the hut where the elders of uh, the Naruk tribe are gathered. The elder, who is elected, uh, Traktor, she's the she's the tribe leader, the current tribe leader, uh, turns to warn you and says, "Guess." Yes. Oh, hey Traktor, nice nice to see you again. <laughs> You've come back from the outside, and you've brought outsiders here. Uh, yes, I have. Um, you see, we are kind of on an urgent uh, mission to uh, to help Dr. Kred's daughter, Jenny, and us too, because we are being aged magically by by something. So basically, we're getting older without uh, doing it like naturally. I heard that you have some involvement with it, and that you could you could help. And yes, these are outsiders, but they are they are very friendly and open-minded. Uh, and I'm saying this in common so that Olive and Doctor Craig can understand me. Like I know that Olive can understand me, but I also want Doctor Craig to understand. Uh, and uh, yes, it seems that there might be a problem with his daughter Jenny. So he, he I think he knows how to explain it better. So uh, Doctor Craig, why why don't you explain what is uh, what, what is going on? Well, there was a potion. I drank it. I pooped out an egg. It hatched into my daughter. There's some timey-wimey stuff going on because of a special ingredient of a dragon that's around here somewhere that you guys supposedly know about. We need to get a sample of this dragon to make the timey-wimey stuff stop. Tractor uh, looks at you and says, The only dragon that was here has been defeated a hundred years ago. All right, where's the body? It is in the sacred mountain, and you are not permitted to visit. Please? Oh, we don't have to visit. Um, can we just have a tiny part of it? It's the antidote. It's the cure for his daughter. Uh, Jenny is uh, kind of toddling about, and uh, Tractor looks at uh, <laughs> Jenny, who is uh, a half-dragon, which kind of corroborates your story. And um, 
Make a persuasion check, I guess. Uh, Dr. Crud, I'm going to give you disadvantage here. Disadvantage? Yeah. But I said please. Okay, so instead of the 19, I'm taking the 16. So 23. A 23, that is, that's good, yeah. Uh, Tractor looks at your daughter and says, What is wrong with her? She's aging very quickly. And it has something to do with her lineage. And apparently the potion maker used parts of your dragon to make his potions. And so you're, this dragon's doing timey-wimey stuff. But we need to find her dad. So we can make her stop growing too quickly. Um, you are quite <laughs> persuasive, even though you don't know it. Um, she is uh, considering what you are saying and says, why should we help you? I can pay you. I can pay you. And I take a bag of gold and I plunk it down. Like, are we at a table? If we're not at a table, I'll just hold the bag of gold. Handsomely. There's no table. She kind of scoffs at the gold and says, Outsiders, always, always the same. Coming in here with gold or technology and, and telling us uh, that we should do things for them. That's not the way things work around here. Uh, okay, uh, so talk to her. Um, it, it would be really nice if we got your help in this because uh, I am also being aged magically because of, because of this. So uh, you see how all my feathers fell out earlier? Or not all of it, but some of them. It's because uh, I want to help Jenny, so then I volunteer to be aged magically as well. And so if, if you don't do anything about it, both Dr. Crud my friend and I will age until probably we die or something. Bing! Both we'll your let, buttons light up. We'll, we'll let Jenny take this one. She can grow a little bit more. Okay. All right. Uh, yes, th 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 that happens whenever um, someone is being aged magically. And if, if we push this uh, red shiny thingy, then we will be the ones to get it. And if we don't, then the daughter will. Uh, you hear a last bing, 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 bing as a indicator that your time is running out. And as you don't press the button, uh, you notice that Jenny is uh, growing in size uh, considerably. She's now uh, uh, as tall as a tractor, uh, five foot five. And um, uh, she is uh, a toddler, a full on toddler. And uh, she uh, turns toward you, Dr. Crud, and says, Mommy, play outside? Maybe in a little while. Bobby's just trying to get some help for you. Because apparently so these guys don't like to help children. <laughs> or get paid for it. I don't understand uh, their motivation at all. <laughs> yeah, they... they uh, I mean, money doesn't really have a use for them. Uh, I am kind of um, special in a way that I really, really like shiny things. Not everyone here does. I... Uh, yeah, they, they don't use money for anything, really, because they have everything that they, they need, so it doesn't mean a lot to them, money. But usually, they they are willing to help someone else, I guess, but only if it won't harm them, because they have... It has happened to them in, before that people have asked for help and then in turn harmed them. So it, they, they are not very trusting of outsiders, but once once they once they find that, uh, that, that, that we, uh, we, we mean well... They, they will probably be more accepting of us, of, of you guys more, because I'm kind of part of them. Olive, you can make an insight check uh, on this. This is this is what I know, at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you're you're fully uh, on point. Thirteen. Thirteen. Um, yeah, you notice that uh, as you pull out this bag of gold, uh, Tractor scuffs are there, but not necessarily all the orcs in the room do. Uh, some of them, like, they've been in touch with the outside world, and these are all individuals, and uh, uh, yeah, they know that they could possibly get individual gain from them, but Tractor is not in in interested in, in that means of living. But uh, she does look at uh, Jenny in shock as she ages up and uh, says, All right. All right, everybody out of the room, except you three. You four, keep the child here. 
And uh, the orcs, the Naruk, uh, listen to her. Like they know what is going on. They know that they don't know what's going on, but they know that Tractor is a leader and has their best interests at heart. And uh, they all scuff out of the room. And Tractor uh, looks around you, looks at Jenny, and says, "All right, you cannot go into the mountain. You cannot retrieve the dragon's corpse uh, because there is no corpse. All right, don't go there. Only harm comes from that." Uh. Wait, what, what do you mean there is no there is no corpse? We... Look, Cass, you've been told the story your entire life that eight heroic warriors from the Naruk beat a white dragon that made its nest here. Yes. Yes, they, I remember that. They never came out of the mountain. Oh. And we... I was not there a hundred times a year ago, but my grandmother knows about this. and She has told me that uh, we cannot go there. Weird things happen if you go to the mountain. Uh, people disappear there. Uh, you can hear the sounds of battle. You can hear the roars of dragon and the war cries of our forebears when you, when you walk the caves there. So you are saying that the dragon might still be alive or that its spirit might still be there hunting it? Perhaps. I do not go there because... People have gone there, and they do not come back. It kind um, of sounds like it's a time loop, like what we're experiencing. Yeah. Where did Flimby go? Who is this uh, Flimby? You can tell, uh, Olive, that um, Tractor does not know uh, who Flimby is and uh, has not heard this name before. So if Flimby acquired a region from here, it's not from her or with her knowledge. Hmm. Ah, so so you're saying that um, so you're saying that you've never met this Flimby. He was a very short. He was a pretty short um gnome guy. At least gnomes are short, right? I, I kind of like uh <laughs> look at the other five really good. Like they're the three feet. They're like about three feet tall, right? And then she kind of like gestures, and he like made potions. I, I know that about him. So you're saying that you've never met him before? I. Listen, many outsiders have come here over the years. They all want to trade. I say, we have everything we need. Why would we let outsiders come in here and, and ruin our lands? It's all about trading and trading and technology with them. We are good the way we are. I have not met this Flimby. When was he here? Forty years ago. Um, Tractor uh, grimaces and... Calls out, Rack! Rack! Come in here! And another orc comes in. This one is uh, tall with braids. An older guy. This is an elderly orc. Uh, he's got a nose ring. And um, he uh, looks like he already knows what's, what's kind of going on around here. And uh, he says, This is about Flimmy de Canto. Yes. Yes. All right. I uh, may have sold him some alchemical reagents uh, many years ago. It's not relevant. I beg to differ. Why did you sell him? Um, so, Cass, you know Rak is a bit of a controversial figure here. He is, uh, as I said before, the Neruk all contribute to their uh, to their uh, communal goals in, in some way, but Rak kind of neglects on that. He's, mm. he's more egotistical. He's... Uh, uh, he would have been kicked out if he weren't likable and charismatic. Uh, people like him, so he hangs out with the with the elders. But uh, he's kind of like entrepreneurial, but he doesn't want to do work with his hands. He would be very successful in Nikamoy or in our world, but uh, among the Naruk, he's only like uh, middle tier. Like people like him because he's very self assured, but uh, he uh, doesn't. Uh, doesn't like to to uh, contribute to the tribe as a whole. And uh, Dr. Crud, what did you ask? What did you sell him? Um, Rak kind of smiles and says, uh, is that uh, gold still on the table? That's and... up to Olive. Sure. <laughs> Olive says yes. Okay, Olive, do you offer up the gold? Yeah. Rak says, uh, all right. I will show you. And uh, Tractor is furious at what is going on here, you can tell, but uh, it seems like 
you are getting what you want and this seems what's best for Jenny right now. And Kess is asking about this, so uh, she allows this transaction to happen. How much gold do you give, Rack? 500. 500? Uh, I suppose that's a lot for uh, for an uh, an orc in a desolate uh, mountain tribe, right? For it's a backwaters a orc? Orc? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's more than the average annual salary in Nikamui. And also uh, hard to carry. It's so heavy. Um, it is. Uh, yeah, well, he's an orc. Everybody here is built again. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, he uh, kind of like hooks it in his belt and says, uh, I will show you what's happening in the mountain. And I will show you where I got the reagent that I sold Flimby de Canto. And Tractor is, is, is furious and says, Kes, no, do not go with, with, with Rack. The mountain is sacred. You must not go in there. It is too dangerous. I, uh, well, but um, if I, if, if I don't do anything, then... I, I I will die anyways because I'm being aged magically. So, um, I mean, th- there isn't much of a choice really. So if, if there is a choice between uh, dying fighting a dragon or something or dying by being aged magically, I'd rather fight a, a dragon, y- you know? I'd rather have a, a warrior's death than just to die by doing nothing. Y- you, I-, I hope you understand. <laughs> Boltzmann so, uh, did mention that you could uh, take this uh, uh, this temporal device off and uh, you would revert back to your normal age, but you couldn't turn it back on again. So then uh, Jenny would start, you wouldn't be able to uh, uh, divert it away from Jenny again. So this is a temporal sponge uh, that uh, does not directly harm anybody, but it's it's just aging you in the moment. Well, Kes, Kes doesn't know that. She thinks that yeah. she's like, w- once once she like wears it, that's kind of it. Like she doesn't know that she can unattune from it or take it off. She just knows that oh, here's a device that I'm uh, that I'm like that ages me. And great. Uh, in order to that's yeah, a she, very she in character. Know. You can uh, you can take ins- inspiration. <laughs> Thank you. So okay. like um, <laughs> like I, I like she genuinely thinks that. So she's like um, I don't think it's like I don't think it's deception. But like yeah, I know it's not true. No, but no, no. She doesn't you, know. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fine. Uh, Olive, Doctor Cred the Third. Uh, what do you do? Do you follow this Rack uh, character or do you uh, go with the cautions of the village chief? Oh, Dr. Crud's going with wherever he has to go to help his daughter. So he's going with Rack. Okay. To read it off of Olive's character sheet, the strongest bonds are built through struggling together. Amazing. You follow Rack, this tall, lanky, uh, but a very muscular orc with a nose ring and braided hair out of the village, uphill, toward the top of the mountain. And um, as you leave the village and uh, its inhabitants behind, uh, Tractor has commanded everybody to uh, to uh, stay behind and not follow you. Um do you take the cart with you or not? Oh yeah, horse he's coming with. <laughs> okay, the horse is following you uh, uphill with its uh, floating cart, and uh, we see the uh, mountain ominously portrayed against uh, the uh, the northern sky, and that's a good point for our break. <laughs> so, thank you for uh, for uh, playing in this first half, Olive. Bye. Dr. Crud the third. Why do these orcs not like children? <laughs> and guess. Uh I, I just disobeyed my uh my tribe leader, but uh I don't know. Hopefully we can make this all work out. <laughs> you got a new family now anyway. And if you like this podcast, please re- leave us a review on iTunes, maybe a five star review, maybe a very good one, and we will read it on air. Thank you everybody for listening. Bye bye. 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 We hope that you're enjoying this episode of the Fire Breathing Kittens podcast. Please leave us a review on iTunes.com. If you leave us a review, we'll read it on air. It's fun listening to the words of your review get read by the characters you know and love. So go to iTunes.com and leave us a review today. Can you think of someone who might enjoy this podcast? 
please share it with them. Is their birthday coming up? A special anniversary? Would you like us to wish them a happy day on your behalf? You can arrange for us to read your shout out on air at firebreathingkittenspodcast.com through our partnership with the website Buy Me a Coffee. Do you enjoy reading books? You can find paperbacks and ebooks based on our adventures on Amazon.com in the bookstore, Fire Breathing Kittens, that part's all one word, podcast. The authors do a great job of adapting the stories into fun novels. We also have official merchandise on Redbubble.com. Imagine owning a notepad with the Fire Breathing Kitten logo on the front, or a t-shirt with one of your favorite characters. And lastly, I'd like to take a moment to sincerely thank all of you. We don't pay to advertise this show, so the only way we can grow is through the support of listeners like you. Thank you. Welcome back to Fire Breathing Kittens. We are joined this time by Olive. Hey, everybody. Kes. Hi. And Dr. Crud the Third. We're looking for my baby daddy. Now, uh, let's do a quick recap of uh, the first half, and let's make it snappy. Um, can all of you roll me d20 to see who will do the recap? Three. Sixteen. Eight. Um, that is going to be... Olive is closest to the number that I rolled. So please do the recap. Uh, <laughs> please tell us what happened in the first half of this episode. And uh, we will continue from there on. Boltzmann asked us to use the Cookie Castle carriage to go to the Nehook Orcs so that we could get a sample from Dr. Crud III's other genetic donor of Baby Daddy. Jenny Baby Daddy so that we can prevent her from continuing to magically age. Okay. And then? Now Rack... A tall, lanky, elderly orc with braided hair and a nose ring, whose flaw is that he doesn't like to contribute to the group as a whole, is, despite the advice of Tacto, the chief orc, uh, she's a barbarian who speaks common but doesn't know Flimby, Rack is going to lead us to the place that they led, possibly, Flimby in the past. There might be a time disturbance in this mountain. It's a sacred mountain that Tacto, the chief, doesn't let anyone go to. So we might all die. Uh... Kess seems to be under the impression that we're going to die regardless, so for her, she'd just like to die a warrior's death. Um, we've tried telling her that that's not going to happen, but she really feels passionate about the fighting, so we're letting her come along. I'm not sure if it's informed consent on her part. Are you going to walk to the mountain? Well, we do have this horse that teleports. Yeah, mm -hmm. horsey. Yeah. My new I mean, horse. That makes sense. Um, uh, do, do I know where this mountain is? Like, have I been near it before? You haven't been inside the mountain before. It's considered uh, sacred ground to the Nuruk, and uh, they don't allow anybody to go in there. So you could or use I a know, teleporting like, horse, but it's going to... Uh, yeah, you, you're going to have to roll on the table again, and there's going to be a bigger chance of failure because none of you have ever been there. I see. Okay. Hey, hey Rack, have you been inside this where we're going? Yes, I have. All right, can you imagine it in your brain? Of course I can. <laughs> okay, can you tell the horsey in your brain where we're going and then hit the button and we'll be there? What? It's magic. Ah, yes. So basically how it how it works is you um is you think of a place you want to go and then you push this big red shiny thing. Uh no, not not the one on me. Uh that one. Uh <laughs> Yes, I that is actually how I got here. I, I got here just in a minute or so. I, I don't know how much time passed, honestly, but um, you can travel any distance. You just have to know where it is. So just think of a place, uh, get onto the cart, and then wait until we are we're all on it, and then press the button, and then you should be good. I, I don't know how it works, but it worked. All right, this sounds very dangerous. I will no. try for your sake, because you paid me good gold, but I'm going to ask for double my rate after this adventure is over. All right. However many coins are in this uh, in this bag, I want as many as those. Rack doesn't know this, but I have like 15,000 coins, so him asking <laughs> for 1,000 instead of 500 is still like 
Jenny's going to die if we don't do this, like, quickly, so I will pay it. Okay. All right. Uh, Besides, yeah. he may not be know how to count, so we could tell him there's like a hundred in there, and then... <laughs> I don't care. As a monk, it's not like I uh, crave physical possessions, so I've just been banking it. When I'm not paying for people to be revivified, because I killed them, of course. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, that's been happening... Uh, sometimes, <laughs> um, more than so, once, <laughs> Rack uh, is going to uh, get up on the carriage and uh, says, "This button." Yes. And s- looks like he's imagining and pressing a, red, or a big red button. Who wants to roll a d100 for me? I don't have any d. You know what? I got it on my watch. I have dice. I can roll a d100. Please go ahead. That's a 20, that's a 12, that's a 10, that's an 8, that's a 6, that's a 4. There's a 100. 75. You got a fantastic watch, Dr. Crad. Uh 75 is on target. That's amazing. So the same process happens. Uh, you and Rack are extended into infinity. Uh, gallop through this uh, dark astral space and uh, pop back into existence. Uh inside a mountain now it's colder here you're up higher and uh you it's not entirely dark you can see like there's light refracting but there's the interior of this mountain is kind of uh crystalline and um kind of uh shimmery it's all shiny Cass. and (laughs) you see um a space before you and rack hops out of the cart looks around and says we are inside the mountain now. This is where I got that egg for that gnome. Oh, you, you got an egg? <laughs> yes, an egg. The, and then I, I looked to Dr. Crad and say, do you think it was the same egg? No, that came out of my butt. A dragon egg, it is. Oh. And I'm only telling you this now because I am, I'm an old man and I don't need the secret anymore, but... You can get as many dragon eggs from here as you want. Oh, really? Old Tractor does not allow people to go in here, but she does not understand how it works. Uh, can I do an, like, insight check on him to see if, like, he's hiding something? Sure, go ahead. Ten. Um, yeah, on a ten, you are looking at Rack and you are just like, Wow. Who knew old Rack was up to to all of this this whole time? That is amazing. Do we see dragon eggs? No. I took us this area. Here. Do you have a little bit of time? I will show you. Well, we have no choice. We need the, the stuff. All right. Let me show you. Do you have any object I can, I can, uh, I can use to demonstrate? Like... What? what? Anything. I will throw it inside the cavern. Olive takes out some dog meat and hands it to you. Rack uh, throws the dog meat in the uh, cavern in front of him. It's kind of like opening up wide. You're in a narrow enclave and it's opening up wider, uh, but it's you don't see any eggs because it's still... Uh, it's still like kind of twisting and tunneling, and there are some uh, holes in the roof where light is still coming through. And Rack says, "And now we wait as the uh, dog meat <laughs> lays there, and another bing goes off." Doctor Crud pushes Kess's button. <laughs> Kess, you age to middle age. <laughs> okay. You now you now have disadvantages on physical ability checks. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> yeah, so, so you, you guys see like the, the feathers that had fallen out of of her like suddenly grow back, and then other ones that <laughs> that were there previously fall out, and new ones come in. Oh, oh! I, I guess it happened again. Yeah, we we, we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> Doctor Crud picks up some of the feathers. Do you need these? Uh, no, no, I don't use them. You can you can have them if you want, or do whatever <laughs> you want with them. Okay, spare parts. I guess just shrugs. <laughs> That'll end up on a surgery patient later. <laughs> uh, Rack, Rack shushes you and says, look, look, look. 
<laughs> and Irak uh, points toward the dog steak and uh, in a flash, it's moving very quickly. You see it uh, return back to the point where Olive threw it in and disappear. And Rak says, this happens every time. It resets every 20 minutes. You throw something in, it comes out, and it is gone forever. Swallowed by time. But you go in there. You grab something, carry it out. It resets. It's back there. The egg is back there. What happens if it resets when you're inside? You are lost in time forever. You no longer exist. Well, we got 20 minutes, Dr. Crud walks in. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, just, I walk in after him. <laughs> okay. Uh, Olive? I follow. <laughs> uh, let me set a timer for 20 minutes. <laughs> um, you all walk into this uh, enormous shimmering cavern and um, I want you to make a luck check. Uh, just Dr. Crud, roll me a d20. That's going to be a three. A three. Um, you uh, are moving in here. Are you operating? Are you being stealthy at all? No, Dr. Crud's on a mission. He needs to get that egg and get the hell out because he knows he's got 20 minutes. Yeah, okay. You walk as fast as possible. And um, as you uh, uh, you go up and uh, you poke your head out, you see an enormous dragon hovering over you. And you may all make... No, actually, it's going to save its frightful presence... Until it's relevant. <laughs> yes, you see this dragon. Yes? You heard it's a white dragon. You heard it's dead. Uh, it's not entirely white. It's kind of gray, kind of uh, pearlescent. And it's uh, looking at you. And in this moment, you know there is still a dragon in these mountains. And uh, somehow you uh, have been told your entire time, that your entire life, that... Uh, the dragon had been defeated a hundred years ago. We've never seen a dragon, and yet it is here. Kes is, like, super excited. She, she like, stares up at it for a second, like, her, her beak kind of wide, her eyes wide open. And then she just, like, flies up and says, Yes! We get to fight the dragon! <laughs> but she, she, doesn't, she doesn't do anything yet. She's just kind of, like, hovering and just, like, uh, swooping around the cave, kind of excited. The dragon opens its mouth and says, Mortals! You come barging into my lair so confidently. I want to know what you want before I will eat you. Well, apparently, you are my baby's daddy. So, meet your daughter, first of all, this is Jenny. <laughs> Second of all, she's very sick, and we need the egg right there to make her well. Impossible. I have never met you before. And are you I have saying... never. That we have mated in some past avenue? <laughs> well, yes and no. You see, uh, a gnome came about around here about 40 years ago, and he got some of the egg. And he used it in a potion. I drank the potion. I pooped out an egg. And then Jenny was born a year later. So, yes and no. You lie. I well, have I'm not been here for... Longer than an hour. Well, I hate to break this to you, but you're in a magical time loop. Hey, hey, Dr. Crud III, let's go out. Let's come back in. Okay? Ready? Okay. Just trust me. Kes, okay. come on. Out. I will eat you now. We'll be right back. Run. <gasps> okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, Kes, Kes goes if Olive does. I mean, she's um, just like, well, the dragon's going to be there gonna fight it later <laughs> i want that same exact i want to go back out and then come back in and that same exact thing to happen and then when the dragon starts to say you lie i have not been in here for longer than an hour i want to say the same words as them <laughs> <laughs> uh before that happens the dragon is going to take a swipe of you uh olive and um does a 19 hit you no my ac is 21 uh 
Oh, it actually got... Uh, it rolls with advantage this time, so does a 36 hit you? I mean, yeah. My AC is 21. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Your <laughs> AC is 21. A 36 hits you. You take 16 damage as uh, the dragon snaps at you, uh, but you are a high-level monk. You run away, and uh, the three of you uh, go back outside of the time loop. Um, so you want to wait until it resets again? You see Rak <laughs> uh, standing outside the time loop. <laughs> yeah. In, in order to see when it is resetting, I toss some dog meat in there so that we can tell when we can start our 20-minute timer. And mm -hmm. then once it resets, I want to dash back in. Same as we did before, same exact thing, except I want to match the words. <laughs> okay. Ding. Dr. Crud pushes his button. Oh, Dr. Crud, you are no longer middle-aged. Uh, you are now a senior meaning you have disadvantage on checks for all ability, all physical ability still, and one mental ability of your choice. Uh, charisma. Charisma, Oh, no, okay. we need that. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> no one likes okay. me. I can't. Dr. Crud turns into a uh, grumpy uh, senior citizen. He's, got, he's mostly bald now. Uh, he's very wrinkled, even more than he already was. And um, you can try and enter the... Uh, the uh, uh, time loop again now. Do you want to ask Rack anything at all while you're waiting here this 20 minutes? You got a cane. It's awfully hard to walk now. <laughs> he laughs at you and says, what is happening to you? This is uh, quite interesting. Are you aging well, because of this? Did we tell I you? I have not seen we, this before. She's sick. Timey-wimey stuff. We're accelerating in age. You do you, man. So, um... You go back into the time loop. You repeat that exact conversation. And uh, at this moment, you repeat this dragon's words back to herself. Make a... Why? I have not been in here for longer than an hour. <laughs> uh, Olive, make a, make a preservation check for me. No. With this. Oh, my God. Oh, oh by, by the way, how much damage did you take? Because I would have applied a quick patch before we went back in for her. Sure. Mark a quick patch off. 16 it's totally cool I, so I, yeah you'd be you'd be filled full up again I'm, i got it's like I'm, a ton of those don't I'm, even worry about it but i'm okay all right a 14 on the dice minus one is a 13 persuasion the dragon does not uh respect your uh, uh response at all <laughs> <laughs> and uh it uh it laughs and uh says I will eat you now. And uh, you may roll initiative. Yay! I have advantage on this. Because barbarian. 18. 16. 12. I would like to free action tell everybody, everybody, run out of the cave. I will once I grab that ache. Yeah, <laughs> we know where the paw is going to swipe, so all his plan is to, like, duck, dash, dodge, dive, grab egg, run. Very smart. Sounds uh, like dodgeball. Dr. Crud, uh, it's your turn first. Dr. Crud's going to go grab the egg. Yes. Um, the egg is not uh, in this uh, particular uh, vicinity. You did not travel far enough. You did not make an effort to be stealthy, so the dragon uh, swooped at you at the first opportunity. You didn't get very far in the cave at all, but in the upside, you're very close to the, to the exit of this uh, loop. Then that's where Dr. Crud goes. He needs the egg. He's going for the egg. Screw the baby daddy. Um, you are going to go for the egg. Uh, make a medicine check uh, real quick for me, Dr. Crud. I would love to. <laughs> 37? Uh, yes. 37. You know how this works. You need... <laughs> You need the uh, paternal DNA. You need the other half of uh, Jenny's uh, genomic lineage. Uh, so if you would get the egg that presumably uh, has been used as raw materials for this potion that you drank, you would only get the part of Jenny's DNA that's already inside her. You're going to need uh, a piece of this dragon's DNA. Okay, Dr. Crud will grab a syringe and stab the dragon and take the blood out. <laughs> Make it a tech roll, Dr. Crud. <laughs> um, that's going to be a 19 plus uh, 9. Well, actually, that's a crit. 
I'm for, sorry, I crit on 19 and 20. You get to harvest an organ. Yes, I harvest an organ. <laughs> Is that organ blood? It doesn't matter, it's DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Try again, or again, try again, or again. <laughs> yeah, um, my syringe goes in and it comes out with an organ. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, your syringe, your giant syringe comes out, uh, filled up uh, with this dragon's appendix. <laughs> I got what I need, I'm out. This is uh, level, level 18, guys. Uh, <laughs> Uh, is that the end of your turn, Dr. Crud? You've successfully harvested the genetic material? Yeah. Yeah, that's all I can really do right now. <laughs> <laughs> next next turn, I disengage and run. All right. Um, then it's the dragon's turn. Uh, the dragon laughs at you. <laughs> you come into my lair and take from me. I will take yep. from you. And uh, you is going to make a uh, grapple check to try and grab uh, Jenny. Oh, now the dragon's going to die. <laughs> uh, let me roll for that. You got stats for Jenny, right? Uh, yes, somewhere. There they are. So, I got news for you, Dr. Crud. Uh, this Secret dragon... No, this dragon uh, is uh, has rolled a uh, natural two with advantage. Oh, so wow. uh, Jenny has to beat a twelve here. Uh, that's going to be hard. She has a negative two in strength. It's going to be a thirteen. Thirteen. <laughs> Jenny, uh, toddler, though she actually, um, I'm going to need her to roll with disadvantage because she's she's still a baby. What does a baby have to do with being a disadvantage? She's already disadvantaged with a negative two. Still. Hey, isn't she like a toddler now? Right. So her strength should go up, on right? Her. So her strength should go up because she's grown up some. Well, maybe uh, Jenny has uh, changed from her initial uh, makeup to something more complex that you uh, haven't uh, fully understood yet. Even though you rolled very high in your medicine check. So do I get to get her out of the negatives a little bit or no? Uh, tell me what you roll. I, I rolled a 12. Listen, this dragon has four attacks. And it can substitute each one for a, for a grapple check. Uh, so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to make four uh, rolls against uh, Dr. Crowd himself. Uh, three, three rolls uh, to... Uh, uh, to uh, account for the for the one that already passed, so I think she, on the twelve she's going to pass. So the dragon okay. with its other three attacks, it's going to try to grapple Doctor Crud the third, who is very strong and very good at grappling. And Jenny is tied to him with a leash. Yes, <laughs> he, so, she uh, definitely is. <laughs> the leash. <laughs> so t that's going to be a twenty-four for Doctor Crud for a strength check. The oh, dragon. Wait, I got this I got, sorry, I got disadvantage. That's going to be a 22 instead. Oh, the dragon got a uh, natural 19 on this one. So um, it has a total of uh, much higher than you in that case. And Dr. Crud, as you, uh, uh, as Jenny foils this, this dragon's uh, feeble attempt at grabbing her, <laughs> it, it rears its head, turns toward you and says, you die now. And grabs uh, you fully in its claws, um, takes off into the sky, is going to take uh, two more attacks, uh, uh, one more attack with its claw, um, which does a 33 hit. Oh, yeah. You got to take 15 damage there. And uh, do both Dr. Crud and Jenny are uh, carried into the, into the sky, deeper into the lair of this dragon. Uh, and that's as soon as Doctor Crud starts getting lifted off, he's cutting the the leash. Aww, my goodness, okay. the sacrifice! Oh. I will I will allow you to to cut the leash as the dragon carries you off. Uh, that's that's very good of you. And um, the dragon 
is going to carry Dr. Kradov into the lair. It di disappears from sight, uh, but it's Cass's turn now. So, uh, Toddler Jenny is right next to you. Um, you are still connected uh, with the tether to uh, to uh, her uh, temporal essence, and um, Dr. Krat has been carried off by a ginormous dragon. Hmm. Uh, so, so, like, Jenny's bigger than I am, right? <laughs> At this point, like she's five foot five, I'm only like five. I'm only five feet. Yeah, I suppose uh, <laughs> she's technically tiny, but she's huge. So yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna uh, say I'm gonna say she's medium sized now. Yeah. Cool. I, I, I'm gonna like um, fly into the air a bit and say like, "Come on, Jenny, can you follow?" And then I, I I'm gonna like uh, kind of gesture to her and see if she can like fly after me. Um. Is, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, what's Jenny's fly speed, Dr. Crud? Uh, it's going to be 60 feet. Ooh. The same as Cass's fly speed. So I I'm going to, like, turn to Jenny and say, oh, very good. So, uh, I I'm going to have to go rescue your father, um, mother, I mean, Dr. Crud. Uh, you come with me, but but, but stay like uh, about sixty. Stay stay a while back, okay? Th this is this is very important. We're going to play tag with the dragon, okay? But you're you're not going to be it. I'm it Jenny right now. Jenny turns toward you and says, <laughs> "Mommy," and takes off after you. Um, yeah. So I, 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna dash. So I'm going 120 feet. You're going 120 feet. After 80 feet, you run into this dragon. Uh, oh. It's uh, slow, it's uh, moving, flying at half speed, even though it's flying extraordinarily fast, even for a dragon. Dr. Crud is very heavy. <laughs> I see, so Again it's only 80 jokes. feet away. Uh, okay, actually, in that case, if it's only 80 feet away, then I'm not going to dash. Um, I'm going to only go, like, my movement speed, 20 feet. I have ranged options, so... Uh, <laughs> I, have a, I have a thing called a lightning javelin. So like, amazing, yeah. Is, is is there a way that I can like aim the lightning, like uh, fire the lightning javelin at the at the dragon without hitting Doctor Crud? Yes. Okay. In that case, I am going to um, I'm going to do that. I'm going to just like uh, take out the lightning javelin. I'm I'm angry as hell. I'm gonna bonus action rage, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say, um, no one carries out my friends or threatens them. You will die, dragon. It's you or me. And um, I am going to throw the um, recklessly attack the dragon with with the javelin. So that will be a it'll be, it'll be an advantage. Ooh, that'll be a I got a natural nineteen, so uh, thirty-two to hit. Amazing, a thirty-two hits for sure. All right, you now. Hmm? With amazing strength, uh, Cass midair throws this lightning javelin, which crackles, turns into a lightning bolt, and uh, hits this uh, flying dragon. Okay, now I'm gonna roll a five d6, um, because it's one d6 for the javelin's damage. This is, this is gonna be like a fair bit of damage, so bear with me while I calculate it. So for the javelin itself, without the lightning, it'll be. Uh, 11 points of damage. Oh, plus rage. That's 14 points of damage without the lightning damage. And uh, because the lightning javelin, the dragon will also immediately take 18. That's another additional 18 points of damage. And um, so the way that the lightning javelin works is like creatures within a line, like uh, 5 feet by 120 feet line, have to make a deck save or take um, 46 damage. For d6, that is. So, like, is the dragon included, or um, does the dragon like not get included because they already took the damage? Like, yeah. How how are you gonna rule that? Um, the dragon is the main creature that you're targeting, so it's not gonna get the damage uh, twice, the uh, electricity damage. Uh, but it's okay. gonna get the forty so forty six that's added onto the uh, actual javelin. So that's eighteen um, points of damage with one attack, and I'm gonna attack again with the regular damage, so I'm still attacking at advantage. That'll be a uh, 12 plus 13, 25 to hit. That hits. All right, and then the dragon's going to take uh, 6 plus 7, 13, another uh, 16 points of damage. 16 points of damage. 
Uh, amazing. Yeah, and that is my turn. I got anger at the dragon and I hit it with a, with a couple of javelins. Um, so how far away are you from the dra dragon now? Uh, I am 20 feet from the dragon. Because I flew 60 feet. Okay. Uh, then uh, at the end of its turn, the dragon is going to take a legendary action and uh, use a tail ag attack against Dr. Crud the third, who's currently being held. Uh... Uh, 35 hits you, Dr. Crud, and you're going to take 24 damage from this. Okay. And that's Olive's turn. Olive has the ability to run up walls and ceilings. She's going to pursue the dragon on the ceiling using the dash action. So uh, you said it was 80 feet away from us? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, I move 55 feet for my first movement, and then using dash, I move another... 55 feet, but it's like I run along the ceiling and then I like drop and I try to land on the dragon. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Uh, Olive uh, speeds up, runs along the ceiling, and as she's uh, upside down, just uh, goes down, uh, just lets herself fall and head first, does a flip in midair, and lands on the dragon. Um... I expend a key point. I um, step of the wind. I can spend one key point to take the dash or disengage action as a bonus on my turn. So that means that I still have my action. Yeah. Can you give me an athletics check with advantage to try and land on this dragon, dragon successfully? This is not going to take an attack. Athletics uses strength, not dex. So I only get a 12. With advantage? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not a strength-based fighter. Yeah, athletics is not my forte. Um, you do not manage to grab hold onto the dragon. However, uh, as it uh, uh, moves by you and um, uh, kind of like dodges out of the way, uh, you do, Burspad, you can make all your attacks in this round uh, against the dragon, but you will fall afterward. Okay, I totally don't mind that because I don't take falling damage as a monk. So I will just try to hit it once, really. Um, I'm, so I'm, I'm using my action. So I used my movement. I used my bonus action as a second movement. And now this is my action. And I'd like to try to roll to hit it twice. Yeah. Go right ahead. I'm not worried about how much damage I do. I basically just want to know if a 24 hits the dragon or not. It does. Okay, I'd like to use Quivering Palm. At 17th level, I gain the ability to set up lethal vibrations in someone's body. When I hit a creature with an unarmed strike, which she said it does, 24? Yeah. Uh, I can spend three key points, so I have now spent four key points this turn, to start these imperceptible vibrations, which last for a number of days equal to my monk level, which is 18. The vibrations are harmless unless I use my action to end them. To do so, me and the target must be on the same plane of existence. When I use this action, the creature must make a constitution saving throw. If it fails, it dies. <laughs> Immediately or after a, a, a few days? No, it, uh, if it fails, it is reduced to zero hit points. If it succeeds, it takes 10d10 necrotic damage. Amazing. Okay, I'm going to make a constitution saving throw. I, I have to use an action. to. Ch I, I, I'm, not, I'm not using... I, I say... Dragon as my free action, because you get a free action speak in each turn. So I say, Dragon, you're wise and old. You know what a quivering palm is. I just did it to you. I am not wise and old. I am young and beautiful. Yeah, you are. You know what a quivering palm is, don't you? Um, the uh, dragon has no clue what a quivering palm is, even oh. though it's ancient. It's actually, it's uh, just that it's young. Uh, you got... A feeling that, to, just like to you, you don't fully understand how time works, but it affects your body differently. It might be the same as uh, this dragon. Um, this is great. So you are using your... Uh, I think like you have to uh, hit a creature with an, un un with an unarmed strike first, and then you can afterward use your action to uh, activate the Quivering Palm. So that's going to be uh, next next turn, I guess. I, you're, well, th I, you're threatening the death. <laughs> yeah, make an, make an Intimidate check. Okay. And roll me damage for this attack. Intimidation was only a seven. I don't really roll that way. Um, I, I'm not charismatic, so I got a negative one in that. And my damage was... 
11, 12 damage. 12 damage. I just want to explain to you, dragon, that, and you can tell I'm being sincere. I'll, I'll be in a truth spell or whatever you want. I can end your life with one action. I've, I've installed lethal vibrations in your body. They're imperceptible you are to you. foolish human. No mortal. <laughs> I do not care about the difference. No mortal can harm me. I control time itself. I control reality here. Oh, so it's a racist dragon, too. All right, I know what I'm doing next turn. Thanks. You are making a... Uh, you can make a second attack. I, I made two attacks. Uh, only the 24 hit. Okay, all right. Amazing. Then um, that's going to be uh, Dr. Crud's turn. Okay, so I remember Boltzmann saying that uh, when you remove the bell, the belt, it will explode violently, correct? Yes, <laughs> very correct. Do Dr. Crud would like to throw this belt into its mouth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, you pull off the... Uh, the uh, tampon or uh, whatever you have been calling it if you refer to it at all and um, immediately as you do so you feel your body quivering and uh, as opposed to to what Olive just did to this dragon you get younger and you are, your wrinkles retract into your head you're a young adult again uh, but this uh, device is beeping into your hand rapidly and as you throw it uh, into the dragon's mouth uh, give me a strength based attack roll Oh, I'd love to. That's going to be a 27. 27 hits for sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's going to be uh, 10, 10 D6 plus uh, your strength damage. Okay. 10 D6. 45. 45? Crazy. Okay. Um, the dragon is taking uh, heavy damage from this, and you, th you, yeah, you throw the... Uh, the uh, cross between a squid and a fanny, fanny pack into its mouth and uh, it disappears down its gullet and <laughs> you hear a loud explosion right next to the claws that you've been held in and uh, uh, the dragon uh, just starts to shake as it, as it uh, flies around and um, on its turn do you want to do anything else Dr. Crud? Uh, that's pretty much all I can do unless you allow me to try to do a, uh, an escape roll to try to get out of its grasp. That would be an action to try and that's, get out. It would be an attack what I uh, or an action. Uh, uh you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do, no, that's an action too. Never mind. Yeah. No bonus actions for you? No, I don't think I have any bonus actions. The dragon is going to uh, swoop down uh, away from uh, Olive has fallen past and landed on the ground uh, without taking any damage. Yeah, I use my reaction to reduce falling damage by an amount equal to five times my monk level, which is five times 18. It's pretty close to 100. Not sure yeah. how much falling damage you were going to have me take. No, that definitely clears it. Uh, before that, the dragon is actually going to take a uh, lair action and um, it's uh, going to uh, reverse some time on itself. And, uh, and uh, you see some of the wounds uh, close up and uh, it starts to heal for a significant amount of damage. Uh, you see that the the time around this dragon reverses and where it's been wounded, it, the, the wounds start to close and... Uh, basically get undone and uh, it says you see there's nothing you can do here that I cannot undo and uh, and then on its turn it's going to uh, turn around and uh, drop Dr. Crud the third and hit both Dr. Crud the third and Kess with a dragon breath and you may both make constitution saving throws Ooh. That'll be a 30, because I rolled a natural 20 and I have a plus 10. Oh, I, saving throw, right? That's a plus 11 for me. So that's going to be a... That's going to be a 30. Of course. What, what what was I thinking with constitution saving throws with this party? Right? It's, uh, it's pointless. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's going to use uh, a... Uh, 
it's also going to use its its frightening presence. You've been talking smack to it so far, but suddenly, as you realize the might of this dragon, it seems not to care at all about you or about the actual use of the of its powers. It's it's basically wielding time itself, but doesn't care about what implications that has on the universe. And uh, you may all make wisdom saving throws. That is good. Which I have advantage against frightened. <laughs> Great. Is it everybody? Me? You as well. Olive as well. Okay. So I rolled a six. My wisdom save is plus two. So that's an eight for me. Guess you are I frightened have... as hell as this dragon. This is the one, this is the one that uh, your ancestors... <laughs> Uh, supposedly killed, but apparently did not. All the stories that you were told about how heroic your people are apparently uh, don't uh, make sense, and it's just killed them and it's going to kill you. I used Diamond Soul and still only got a 14. Um, okay, uh, Olive, you feel very frightened as well. This is uh, obviously a greater foe than probably any you've faced before. And Doctor. you know you you faced a lot of foes, but this is a dragon, but it's wielding power like a god, just uh, more frivolously. Doctor Crud, you uh, are on a mission, and you don't care, right? Doctor Crud rolled a twenty-seven. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you pass. You would fight the gods themselves for your daughter. <laughs> what it looks like is the dragon drops him, rings fire on him puts out a frightening will, and Dr. Crud just looks at it. All right. Uh, make an intimidation check. Can, can I have advantage because of resisting both the fire and the frightened right at the same time? Sure. Uh, that's going to be 17. I only get a plus one in intimidation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not very impressed. Um, that's going to be uh, Kessa's turn. Okay, I, I am frightened, and has the dragon moved away from me at all, or closer to me? It's moved away from you. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll stay where I am, probably I'll just hover on the spot, and just like, uh, I don't know, I'm just gonna like reach for my bow, and uh... Run for the door! Run for the door! He doesn't have me anymore! Run! Uh... <laughs> well, Cass is going to like... She, she's she's gonna like shoot twice. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, she's gonna pull out her her longbow, and um, she's also going to yeah she's she's gonna cast Zephyr's Strike actually. So um, drop dropping rage of course, and because uh, I think rage ends as soon as I cast a spell, or I can't cast spells while raging. You can't cast spells during rage. Right, and I think it, it's like a bonus action for me to uh, not rage anymore. Okay, uh, I will drop rage because I'm because I'm frightened, and um, as my action, I'm going to try to shoot it twice with my longbow. Uh, I'm attacking recklessly, but I have disadvantage, so it's just going to be a straight roll. That's seven plus thirteen. That's a twenty. It's a twenty hit. A twenty does not hit, unfortunately. Okay, and then I'm going to attack again. <laughs> Another twenty, which doesn't hit, and does I'm going hit. to action surge. And I'm going to attack again. <laughs> uh, you were rolling uh, with disadvantage, by the way, because you're frightened. Yeah, but I was also attacking recklessly, so it, it just oh, canceled yeah. the advantage. Yeah, straight roll. Um, I'm going to use inspiration <laughs> for this. <laughs> I rolled my inspiration text and I got a 1, and my previous one was a 19. So, yep, I just shoot three times and I miss three times. <laughs> oh, but you... That was a good try. Uh, action Surge allows you to take uh, f another action, uh, which is two attacks for you, so you can attack oh, one more time. I can attack one more time, okay. Oh, okay. This is a 28 now. That hits. 28, wonderful. So now it's just going to do like 1d8 plus... I'm marking it as my favorite foe. That doesn't require any action, just happens whenever I uh, attack. So it's going to be an extra d8. So this is my d8. That's going to be uh, 2 plus 8 plus... It's going to be 13 piercing damage. Okay. Amazing. And I'm going to start flying away because I'm frightened. <laughs> so I'll move my... <laughs> you don't I'll have move to move away. away. You, can't, you can't move closer. Yeah, exactly. But I, I'm going to start moving away because, yeah, I'm scared. <laughs> Makes sense. Olive, that's your turn. 
Uh, the dragon has now landed, uh, but you are frightened, so you cannot move toward it. Uh, Cass, uh, by the way, you can, get, you can re-roll that saving throw. Uh, you can get another wisdom saving throw to try and snap out of this. Okay, I will do that. And that'll be a natural 19. It's 21. That's what you need to get out of this. Amazing. You are not frightened anymore. You harm this dragon now. It's not It's not made of... It's not a god. Olive, that's you. Please make a constitution saving throw. <laughs> Olive, um, unfortunately, just this dragon has a plus 16 to its constitution saving throws, and it rolled a tw- total of 28. Please take 50 necrotic damage. And now I'd like to make an intimidation check. 50 necrotic damage? Yes. I didn't move. I didn't blink. I just did it. And I'd like to make an intimidation check as I say, I have quivering palmed you, dragon. Let us leave, or I will kill you. Olive. Yeah. The reverberations move through this dragon's body, and you see it with your enhanced monk um, awareness. Move around the dragon's organs, and then... All of a sudden, you see the same movement in reverse, and it goes back. It is immune to necrotic damage. Okay. Well, that makes sense why my intimidation check was a six. (laughs) (laughs) I'm very sorry. I guess necrotic damage is the passing of time. (laughs) Okay. I'd like to use my step of the wind. I spend a key point to take the disengage or dash action as a bonus on my turn. Okay. And now that Dr. Crud the Third is free, I'd like to grab Jenny. If she's willing, if she tries to bite me, I'm going to let her. And I'm going to say, Jenny, he's, he's free. Your mama's free. Okay? We're all going to go together to the exit. And I'm going to try to dash. Make a perception check uh, okay. to see if you can find Jenny. 17. Jenny is nowhere to be seen right now. All right. That, there goes that plan. Uh... Dr. Crud the Third, where's Jenny? I left her with you. Cass, where's Jenny? Uh, do I see Jenny? <laughs> I mean, I, I told her to follow uh, we'll me. See, we'll, see, we'll see on your turn. Okay. Um, <laughs> I have to run up to the dragon again, but I'm afraid. So I'd like to please use my wisdom saving throw. Okay. That's a 19. Please let me know if it fails. I have diamond soul. Uh, 19 is not enough. It's a 21 you need. Okay, that one's a 24. Amazing. I used a key point to use Diamond Soul. You are uh, not frightened anymore. Okay, thank you. That ends my turn. And uh, at the end of its turn, uh, it's going to take another uh, tail attack at Dr. Crud the Third, who's right in front of it. And uh, it's going to roll a 34 and do 25 damage to you, Dr. Crud. And that's going to be your turn. You know just that you you are standing are you? inside a, of a a horde a small horde of this dragon and it's brought you here and says I'm going to kill you here. You don't uh yeah make a big, make a perception check for me as well. I'm going to use my nose to get advantage cuz I know what my daughter smells like. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> 21 a 21. Uh you see Jenny up in the air. And um, uh, she is uh, looking at what's going on with some kind of expression on her face, which seems to indicate she's comprehending more than she's letting on. But uh, you are going to have to get trouble getting to her, but you can call to her for sure. I'm going to use my my uh, my telepathy bond with her to tell her, go for the exit, and then I'm going to go for the exit as well. You're going to disengage? No, I'm going to dash. I'm going to let him take a swipe at me. I'm going to dash. Okay. I tell her to dash as well. So she goes 120 feet towards the exit, and I go 60 feet. Okay. Yeah, you go uh, toward the exit. Uh, you're going to take uh, 26 damage from its bite attack. Okay. And as you uh, move toward the exit, uh, you are met with a large... Horde of orcs uh, jumping from behind boulders and running up to the dragon saying, Char! 
charge. And um, they will uh, run up to the dragon and start to hack into it. The dragon did not expect this, did not see this coming. Apparently, it's been <laughs> resetting its own memory every time it's been closing the loop. And these orcs and this dragon have been in this battle for a uh, hundred years, every 20 minutes. And uh, everybody who has entered the time loop in between may have altered moments, uh, but it was either reset or erased. And these orcs are starting to hack into the dragon, dealing heavy damage. And right after that, it's going to be the dragon's turn. And uh, she says, no, no, not at the hands of puny mortals. I cannot let this happen. And uh, as she starts to try to close this time loop and return it to the beginning, guess you feel a, a, uh, an object on your waist vibrate and the, uh, the uh, fanny pack, as you look down, the tampon, the time sponge, <laughs> the clock sucker, <laughs> is is uh, radiating and seems to absorb all the magic that this dragon is using in this moment as it uh as your body also uh, reverts to its young adult stage and uh Ooh. it explodes in a uh large radius <laughs> uh, you may make a reflex saving throw uh is, is that dexterity or uh sorry yeah a dexterity saving throw okay, please i have advantage on these because uh barbarian it's an effect that i can see i presume I rolled two twos, so that's a seven. <laughs> that's a seven. You take uh, 39 damage, uh, 39 force damage, so it's not halved, uh, regardless of whether you were in rage. Uh, yeah. And, uh... I'm under, I'm under 200 now. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems that this dragon's technique has not worked uh, this time, and the orcs shout, We can take them! Come on, get in here! Battle her! Be warriors! <laughs> and, uh, guess that's your turn. What are you going to do? You are no longer frightened. Um, I mean, I I'm gonna look to my, my friends. Do, do, do I see that they have Jenny? Like, do I see that everything's all right? Um, they're, your friends are... They, yeah, it's chaos right now. I think <laughs> Dr. Crut was just running, but that was before your uh, orc ancestors came. And, uh... Olive is uh, is uh, cowering still. No, I got over my fear. Oh, Olive got Olive got over her fear, and uh, is standing at the ready to uh, to escort Doctor Crud and Jenny to the to the exit. Okay. Um. Well, I, I'm gonna like turn to them and say, "Well, I've always wanted to fight a dragon, and I I see that my uh, my comrades, my brother, are are doing that. So I'm going to fight this dragon with them. Uh, you guys can go if you want to. You guys can fight if you want to, but." You don't have to wait for me. I'll, I'll I'll be here until the dragon dies, <laughs> or until I die. It's your turn. And yeah, like that was my like free action saying that. And uh, how far away am I from the dragon right now? Uh, I think you're about sixty feet away. Sixty feet away. Okay. In that case, I'm going to uh, fly sixty feet toward it because that's my movement speed. Uh, I'm going to bonus action rage. And I'm going to start biting it. I'm going to start hitting it with my beak. I am so excited. I get to bite a dragon. <laughs> and I'm attacking recklessly, so yeah. Rolling at advantage. Um, good, because I rolled two, so then 13 plus 13. So 26 with the advantage. Um, two hit. 26 hits. All right, I'm going to bite it. And I'm going to be doing an extra 2d12 damage to it, because this is psychic damage. Uh, actually, wait, is there a save associated with it? I have to double check. Infectious Fury. Oh, yeah. Um, the dragon has to make a wisdom saving throw. Uh, it rolls a 20. Okay, uh, that passes, so it doesn't take any extra damage, but from the bite attack, it takes 2 plus 3, 5 plus uh, 12 points of damage from my first attack. And I'm going to attack it again. And that is going to be a 23 to hit. A 23 hits. Wonderful. And that's another uh, 5 plus 5 plus 7. That is 17? Yeah. 17 um, points of damage. And uh, another wisdom save, because I'm going to try to use the feature again. I'm going to try to use Infectious Fury. That is a 16. 
that just passes. My DC is 15, so it doesn't take any extra damage. Ay, ay, ay. Um, but okay. yeah, I, I'm going to be just there, uh, biting it, uh, enjoying life. <laughs> okay. Um, Olive, Dr. Crud, I uh, would like to know if you're going to stay in this battle or run away. Uh, Dr. Crud, Jenny does not uh, appear to be uh, obeying you right now. You tell her to call, to, to come with you uh, through your telepathic link, but uh, uh, she is, um, she is uh, hovering in the air. She's flapping her wings, and as you look, she is starting to age uh, rapidly after this uh, tampon has, has uh, exploded. And you uh, look up, see your daughter there. She turns into a child, into uh, a tween, into a teenager. She's uh, about 10 feet tall now, taller than you. She's a, uh, a titanic-looking, uh, beautiful, young, uh, Luxodon dragon woman with scales and a trunk and uh, a dragon tail. And uh, she is hovering in the air right now. What do Olive and Dr. Crud do in that order? Olive looks to Dr. Crud the third and Jenny and could it be Dr. Crud the third and then Olive? Yes, yeah, sure. Dr. Crud the third, what do you do? If we kill this dragon, you think that will stop it? I think this dragon is the only one who can save Jenny. That's why I got the organ. But like this dragon controls time. I think the only one who can undo this or stop it or understand it is the dragon, don't you? I don't understand it. Dragon, can you stop her aging pro accelerated aging process? The dragon is uh, in battle with these eight orcs right now. Um, Olive, you think back to just earlier today and your conversation with Kirby, and you're thinking about what to do in this situation. I think Bolts, we, our only hope is going to be Bolt, 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 Boltsman. Boltsman definitely doesn't eat us as much. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should just get out of here. Yeah. Um, if you think that's the right thing to do, I'll follow. All right. Uh, yeah. Jenny, we're going to help you. Come home. Come to mommy. Come to mommy, Jenny. Come to mommy. Come to mommy. Olive and Dr. Crud the third, uh, run toward the exit, uh, and leaving the time dragon behind. And to your relief, uh, Jenny follows shortly behind you. While Kess and the eight uh, fated Neruk warriors that are 100 years old uh, are beating up this dragon to a pulp, it takes a while, but now that its ability to, uh, to reset this uh, lair has been taken away, by uh, the uh, temporal devices that you brought in here, it seems like she was always going to lose this battle, which is why she kept resetting it. And Kess, you get to fight alongside your eight warrior ancestors, and there are now nine champions of uh, the Neruk. Yay! So what Kess has always wanted. Olive, Dr. Crud, you move outside of the, of the uh, time loop limit, and Jenny swoops in behind you, lands with a uh, loud thud on the ground. She's got elephant, elephant feet, but she is, again, much bigger than you. Uh, and looks at Dr. Crud and says, Mom. Jenny. I'm sorry. I was hit with the time magic and I, I suddenly realized uh, what I could do. I control this. I, I, I'm growing up because I want to grow up, Mom. Well, we don't want you to grow up too fast. We're going to get you some help. But I don't want that, Mom. I, I've i been looking at what you do, and I, I'd not like, like that dragon over there, but I don't think I'm entirely like you either. And I think I have to find my own way, maybe. If we don't help you, you're going to age to be dead very soon. No. You're going to come with me right now, young lady. No, mom, you're not listening. You're coming with me I right now, young lady. I have been aging because I want to age. I am half time dragon. I control my own age. You're coming home with me right now, young lady. <laughs> so what are you going to do to me? You're going to turn me back into a baby now that I'm a full grown teenager. Is that what you're going to do, mom? No, I don't. 
If you want to be a teenager, you can be a teenager, but you're coming home with me. Mom, I want to go out there and I don't need your approval, but it would mean a lot. You're not old enough to go out there yet. You're coming home with me. I'm as old as I want to be. Hey, you haven't done any growing up. You're still a kid. No, Mom, I'm starting to grasp on how this time dragon thing works. You didn't get to raise me out here, but in here, I spent the time with you, and I spent the time throughout all the ages, and I, I've, I've learned from you. Of you've, you've, you've raised not the body, but you've raised me, and with that, uh, you are quite hurt. She reaches into your bag and uh, puts a, a quick patch on you, and heals you for uh, seventeen damage. Well, Faye, you, but you're still coming home with me. I'm sorry, Mom. I don't want to. And uh, Jenny uh, looks at you tearfully and takes off and flies outside of this cave. Cass, she's flying away. Do something. <sighs> Cass is way too far away to hear me. This is totally useless for me to say that. But as a not flying person and with a not flying person, I'm like, Cass, where's Cass? Did she come with us? I mean, I have a passive perception of 18. Or, or like, if, if you want, DM, I could make a perception check to see if I heard that. And, and do, like, a wisdom check to see if I can get out of my rage and actually, like, do something. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll roll perception. That's a lower than my passive. I rolled a three, so that's an 11. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if I heard. I think Olive is shouting pretty loud, so you you are uh, hearing this. Okay. Uh, oh, and then I'm going to do a wisdom save. I got above a 10, so yeah, I kind of step out of my rage, and then I, like, uh, <laughs> I, like, I, I don't disengage. <laughs> I, I just, I just like, uh, start, go start like, uh, flying over. Do I take any damage from the dragon hitting or anything like that? No, uh... <laughs> It's fine. You, uh, yeah, in the time this conversation is place, you guys have pretty much won the battle. The dragon lies defeated on the ground. Oh. There's a lot of, sh there's a lot of shiny stuff. Oh, in, in that case, like, um, yeah, I, I probably heard her. I was busy, like, eating the dragon. <laughs> I was busy, like, digging into its flesh and starting to eat it. And okay. I was like, oh, I Olive, you want me to, oh, what, where is Jenny going? I'm gonna just, like, uh, say as I kind of, like, fly toward them. Yeah, uh, you see Jenny flying away. And uh, she's flying away at a leisurely pace. I see. Uh, knowing that uh, Crud can't follow her. I, I will I will call out and say, uh, Jenny, uh, are you sure you want to just leave? You fly after Jenny and you ask her this and, and she says, yes. He doesn't understand. Uh, what, what are you going to do now that, that you left? I need to figure that out for my own. I see. Uh... You know, I, I left this, uh, this orc tribe. You see, you see the orc warriors who are fighting the, the dragon and the ones who are at the village that way? I actually left, um, left them for a year to try and figure things out. But I figured out a lot. And, you know, family is very important to me. I also figured out by fighting alongside these orcs that I want to come back. So, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think you and Dr. Crud should, should talk things out. Um, and then I'm going to call back to Dr. Crud and say... Dr. Krad, if, if she wants to figure things out, she she should. But, um, yeah, let, let's just... We want to make sure that you're safe. And that you, uh, that you won't just get... Uh, we want to make sure that you're safe. So, uh, maybe you two should probably talk it out before you just leave and uh, do something rash. Or maybe you should uh, think about it a little bit, little bit and then come back. But, uh, we're very far away from Dr. Krad's home. I kind of, like, look at him questioningly because I, I assume that you live in Guaso. Yeah, Nick, boy. It's like everybody else. Yeah, um, we are very far away from that. It will take a very long time to get there. So, um, how about this? How about you come to Nick and Wai with us? Uh, and then, uh, and then you and Dr. Krad can talk things out. And if you decide that you really want to, like, uh, take a break, you, you can. But then, um, I, I think it should be something both you and Dr. Krad uh, decide because he will be he's, he seems to love you very much and uh, if his daughter just leaves I don't know it's, it might be really sad <laughs> um, what As do you, you think Dr. Crud? <laughs> yeah you uh, you've I guess you've, you've 
flown after Jenny and caught up with her and and uh, been saying these things. But you're far. You're you're, you're a, away from Dr. Crud and all of oh. now. But uh, Jenny has has landed and uh, looks down as you've been saying this to her. She's like twice as tall as you. And uh, but you do have some shared experiences. And she looks up at you and says, "All right, I'll go back." But it's just because I care about him and not because because it, it's what he told me to do. Yes, exactly. Um, yes, th that is why I think we should do things. And I will probably... Hmm, I, I don't know what I will do yet. I, I might stay here with, with my uh, orc family or I might go back. But I, I think I'll go back with you and then decide later. But yes, we should all do things of our free will. And I appreciate that you care about him. So what, what do you say we go back? Are you ready to go back now or do you want to stay here a minute? Let's, let me go talk to my mom. Yes, your mom. And uh, <laughs> Dr. Crud, Jenny, mm -hmm. you see, you haven't heard this conversation, but Jenny uh, walks up to you and um, she doesn't say anything. She just pulls you in for a hug and lifts you up. And with that, we're almost going to close this episode because after these events, you did find some uh, magical items in this dragon's hoard, which I will share in the chat right now. And you can uh, choose which ones uh, you want. Just choose which one you think seems most apt for your character. And please read them. Whoever uh, uh, has decided first uh, can call dibs. <laughs> I feel like the soul biting tooth was intended for Olive, but because she has PTSD from increasing tooth number, she's not going to take it. She's going to give it to the guild inventory because it says it increases your total number of teeth by one and she can't go there. <laughs> the last time she increased her number of teeth, she woke up unconscious on a spaceship. So... <laughs> Oh my god! Uh, yeah, she did. Actually, yeah. Doctor Crud, you um, can you can always <laughs> offer to remove a, a tooth from from Olive. He's done that before. That's why I'm not doing it. Oh, I, actually, <laughs> if, if if you don't want it, maybe I can take it. Even though I, I'm not sure how it works, because I have like a beak. Maybe I can put it like on the tip of my beak, kind of. Yeah, yeah, you can have it, and it it sounds kind of like you would be the one, the sparkly one, the bobble of covetous gods. You can have them both if you want. Oh. It huh. sounds like the amulet of motherly embraces for Crud. Yes. Uh, Crud, can you please read the amulet of the motherly embrace? Wondrous item legendary. This golden pendant is warm to the touch. It feels heavy when lifted, but light when worn. While wearing it, your weight increases by 50 pounds. Your body becomes soft but firm, and you gain plus two bonus to armor class. The am amulet causes your hugs to gain magical properties. When you use an action to hug a creature, they can choose to re-roll one saving throw they make within the next eight hours and use the higher roll. Once they have used this benefit, you can hug them again to restore it. In addition, you gain advantage on grapple checks. You count as one size larger for the purpose of determining what creatures you can grapple. And you can grapple a creature even if it is normally immune to the grapple condition. Any creature grappled by you has a disadvantage on attacks and dis dexterity saves as they can't help but relish in your warm embrace and guess you're taking the bubble of covetous gods and the soul biting tooth yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh can you read them okay so um <laughs> I'll, I'll read the, cov the covetous one so um bubble of covetous gods wondrous item it's an artifact Ooh, a two minute optional optional so this small trinket glimmers with a spark of a thousand stars and is unambiguously the shiniest thing in the universe. Oh my god. Yes, Kes is definitely taking this one. <laughs> Should any gem cutter, artificer, or even deity succeed at creating an object that could be considered shinier, the bobble will adjust to exceed in shiniest. So I have the shiniest thing in the in the universe. Wonderful. The bobble will stop sparking, sparkling only when the last star in the universe dies out and nothing can take away its magic even then, not even anti-magic field. You can use an action to throw the bobble at a group of enemies and distract them as the spell of Jim's glowing coin. Oh my god, yes. Uh, you can attune to the bobble by staring at it for an hour without blinking. If you do, you absorb some of its spark into your body, and while it is on your person, you gain the benefit of a crown, crown of stars spell, which lasts until you've expended all modes of light and gets renewed each dawn. 
In addition, once per long rest, you can exude the multitudes of light within you and cast a prismatic spray at enemies by screaming at them. Yes. Constitution is the spellcasting modifier for these spells. They require no components, and you can use them even when you're otherwise unable to cast magic, such as during a rage. Oh my god, yeah. This was, like, it's perfect for Kess. Uh, want me to read out the soul biting tooth as well? Which Olive refused. Uh, <laughs> canonically. Okay. Yeah, please read it out. Okay, so the soul biting tooth, wondrous item, legendary, requires attunement. This golden fang can be inserted into your mouth, increasing your total number of teeth by one. The tooth has a profound effect on your physique and increases your constitution score to 20. You gain a powerful bite attack, which you can use to make unarmed strikes. If you hit with this attack, you deal force damage equal to 2d10 plus your strength modifier Ooh. instead of the bludgeoning damage normal for an unarmed strike. If you reduce a creature to zero hit points with this bite attack, you can choose to eat its soul, causing you to regain hit points equal to the damage of the attack. Creatures whose souls you eat do not pass on to any afterlife and cannot be returned from the dead. In addition, you can destroy up to 500 pounds of inanimate matter for long rest by consuming it. This includes cursed and magical items as well as select artifacts. Ooh, this is, this is cool. You sure you don't want it, Olive? <laughs> Yeah, I don't like the idea of eating souls. I stop eating. Th so I technically don't need to eat food ever. And I think out of fear of eating something soul, I would never eat again if I put this in my mouth. Ah, uh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll probably like uh, keep it. Or I'm not sure. I, I might just like uh, give it to the guild or I haven't decided yet. But yeah, I'm going to keep it for now. And maybe if Cass like retires, she can donate it to the guild or something. You can have it. You can put it in your mouth, in your beak. Yeah. Yay. Make it a gold. It will become a golden beak canonically. Oh, that's that's awesome. <laughs> Kess is uh, gonna be very <laughs> overpowered soon. Now when she looks in a mirror, she's just gonna keep looking at her golden beak. <laughs> yep. Uh, it's, it's gonna be like an endless loop. She'll probably like stare at, at a mirror for like uh for like a week at a time, possibly. <laughs> You also get uh, 50,000 gold each. And Ooh. as you uh, walk back to your carriage laden with precious uh, gems and uh, gold and magical items, uh, we are going to end this episode as uh, Crud and Jenny are walking alongside each other with Jenny's hand on Dr. Crud's shoulders. Thanks for playing, everybody. Thanks for DMing. <laughs> Today we have had... Olive. Bye. Guess. I am now the shiniest being in the universe. And Dr. Crud the Third. Teenagers. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Hey, Gina. Yeah, Patrick. It's nice out here, isn't it? Yeah, and here we are in the middle of the woods, alone, at night, with no cell service or protection from the elements in a place called... I, I don't have my glasses on. What does that sign say? Uh, Crystal Lake? Ah, that, that, that sounds so peaceful. What could possibly go wrong? Oh, what's that lumbering madman in the woods? Kill, 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 you say? Methinks you've given me an idea for an awesome podcast. Well, she sure seems to like the idea. So join me, Patrick Hamilton, and Gina Radcliffe, my partner in crime, for Kill by Kill, as we unpack every glorious death, crazy character motivation, and inexplicable wardrobe choice from the entire Friday the 13th franchise, and much, much more. Talking about you, hello Mary Lou, prom night too. It's guaranteed to be a thrill ride of emotion from two horror film fans with way too much time on their hands. But don't take our word for it. Each episode will be joined by incredible guests, including Hollywood movie directors, film critics, TV execs, horror writers, comedy podcasters, even my date from senior prom. Plus, I'm pretty sure we're the only podcast in the world that asks you to choose your own death adventure. Patent pending. It's a real navel gazer that everyone should try at least once. So come on over to the not so dark side and join us for Kill by Kill on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcatcher right now. 
Patrick, Jason's standing behind me right now with a giant knife. <laughs> yes, but it's not a knife. It's just a marshmallow roasting stick. Uh, maybe he just wants a s'more. Everyone loves those, even mutant backwoods killers. But how is he going to fit a s'more through the holes in that mask? Tensions with Toby provides an unrehearsed, unedited masterpiece as he drives. Without knowing his topic till actual time of recording, his skills of one-take recording makes him stand out. Driving in the southeast part of Saskatchewan, his show is unmatched, so let's tune in and see what his topic is on Tensions with Toby. <laughs> <laughs> 